Today's chat is brought to you by, well, all of your support. Through the patronage you provide the Focus Fire chat team through Podbean's crowdfunding, we are able to provide you with the weekly podcast as well as the website and other aspects of Focus Fire chat. If you have any interest in becoming a patron of the FFC, please be sure to visit our website and click on the support link. Even a single dollar helps. And for those of you who are already patrons, thank you again for your generosity. You may have heard the whispers of guardians gathering in the shadows, exploring the mysteries of this world and the worlds which surround us. We are all in search of truth. Sometimes we need to focus that search, focus that fire. And so we come together. Join us. Join the discussion. Welcome to Focused Fire Chat. Welcome back for episode 169 of Focus Fire Chat, recorded live on May 24th over on twitch.tv slash Focus Fire Chat. As always, want to give a big shout out to our live chat here with us tonight. Thank you so much for joining us once again. Our topic for tonight's episode is going to be a look at the lore book, Truth to Power. It is going to be a high level look and it will be a summary look. We're not going to we're going to try not to get into too many of the tangents. Uh, another little side note. Yes, this is episode 169, even though we don't have an episode 168. <laughs> Because I am trying to keep track of the actual chats. Excuse me. Um, so 168 was the Daily Lives of Guardians. We didn't get a chance to do a recap episode of that one. Um, but yes, so I know some of you guys don't like it when I skip numbers on the uh, podcast feed. Sorry. Um, but as always, let's run through a quick introduction of those on the show for tonight. Uh, as always, this is your host, Blue Crew 86. Next up, we have our own master social media, the one and only Green Eyed Music Lover, who has re- personally asked me to revamp her introduction. So I will be doing that hopefully this next week. <laughs> Green, I hope you're doing well. How's the week treated you so far? Hey, it's not been too bad. Thanks to the uh, the thing that you just discovered tonight about how if you play some comp matches during the week... And even if you don't touch it again, once reset happens, they give you extra points. Well, because yeah. of that little mechanic, I have Recluse, and I will have Luna's Howl shortly. <laughs> so, I'm doing pretty good as far as game goes, yeah. Is that a I'll new do. thing? Because I was really surprised when I logged in, and that I happened. I think it's been around for at least two seasons. Okay. At least this season it's been around, but I want to say it's been around two seasons. Okay. Okay. All right. Mm. This shows you how much I play Crucible. Um, <laughs> and finally, uh, once again, we have in the hot seat as guest co-host, we have our good friend, the Wish Dragon, who always helps keeps us on our toes, Issa Cole. Cole, how are you doing? Hello. I am exhausted. Not going to lie. I am utterly exhausted between working a full-time job and getting the merchandise ready for the printers for Guardian Con, which I have less than a week to get to them and get it shipped to me. I'm I'm tired. I want to sleep. I want pancakes. You should go get pancakes after the show. We're definitely gonna get pancakes if we get done in time. Nice. <laughs> Challenge accepted. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, now I'm good. Just exhausted. I want to sleep. Um. Well, the reason I, I was kind of putting together, I've I've been trying. So this is gonna be kind of a. It's not it's not an awkward thing, but it's just kind of a an odd thing for me. Um or not that's that's just the wrong word. I have I had just wanted to make a, a comment about something that had happened this past week that I know a lot of people in our our circle of community the community part of Destiny have kind of experienced. Um and you know, I saw uh Mr. Uh Happy Sad Happy Sad over in uh Beard's channel kind of made a comment about this too. Um, you will notice that Beard is not on this particular episode. Um, we're not, I, I'm not, I'll be kind, I'm just going to be honest. I'm not sure if he's going to be back. Um, so we wanted to, or I wanted to try to put into words and explain the situation a little bit better for anybody who was curious about that. Um, Beard kind of is, 
he's in a he's in a negative space right now. Uh, he's had a lot of things going on, uh, and he made the choice for himself to step away from pretty much all social media, uh, including my understanding was including content creation as a whole for the most part. Um, you will probably have already found that uh, he did a YouTube video about this particular thing. Um, we we don't know uh, what's going on, really. Uh, we, this was kind of as, as some of you who have reached out. I know a number of you guys have reached out to me. I know a number of you have reached out to mm-hmm. Green. Uh, I, I, again, blunt honesty, uh, it surprised us as much as I think it surprised you guys. We I didn't realize that it had gotten to the point that it had gotten to. Um, I completely want to make sure that it is understood that we support Beard and whatever he chooses to do. This was not a decision that we uh, we pressured him into. He made it lightly. No, I know, and I don't either. think he did either. Um, but I also want to make it clear that we didn't like it. Wasn't something that we were like we rem- like moved him off. Like no, this was a decision. This was the decision that Beard made a hundred percent. Uh, on his own um, and I just wanted to kind of clear the air and kind of kind of explain that situation a little bit better because I know that it has left a couple people confused um, you know I think there was a lot there's a lot going on with him and I really encourage I'll, I'll link the YouTube video uh, to to uh, that in our show notes but I really encourage you, if you really have questions, to watch that. Uh, he does an excellent job in kind of explaining a good general, yeah, a good is. general summary of why it was not because of any one thing. Uh, I know he was getting fed up with the toxicity that has been recently going around in the community, and not just our community. Uh, it's you know anime community, um, the game, the other games that he plays. Those communities are kind of struggling too. Um, and that, that kind of coalesced with a lot of personal things that are going on with him. Uh, you know, there's the there's just a number of things. Uh, as with everyone, you know, everyone, there's a lot of things going on under the surface that we might not necessarily know about. And that's just, that's the situation. Uh, so I just wanted to kind of open that discourse up. If you do have uh, questions, concerns, um, feel free to DM me on Discord, DM Green on Discord. Uh, mm-hmm. we're, we're more than happy to chat with you. Uh, I know that a number of you have also sent messages of solidarity to beard. And I really, I really, th- I haven't gotten a chance to get those to him cause I don't really have a way, uh, to communicate with him. Um, but I have been trying to get them to him. Uh, and I Same. appreciate, I, I know that he, when I do get those to him, uh, I know that he will appreciate that. So thank you for those of you who have, have reached out. Uh, Green, I didn't. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to surprise you with that. Um, did you? No, no, Did no. you want to I've, say anything? I, no, it's just I've. I'm kind of re. I'm in the same spot you are. It's like I want Beard to find a happy space, find a happy place for him, and so whatever it, whatever needs to happen to make that happen, mm-hmm. I I hope he can find that. And as far as people wanting to talk about it or needing to get a little bit more information or f- try to figure things out um my dms are open have been this entire time i know a few of you have dm me directly pretty much the day it happened that's perfectly fine um the big thing is is remember that he needs space right now he did mention something about possibly returning to at least a portion of what he was working on before But we don't know exactly when that's going to happen or if that's going to happen. So be very, be very respectful, um, show your love and support, but try not to be overly, I want to say smothering, but that's a bad word for it. Just, just be respectful of the -hmm. distance that he's asking for currently, Mm -hmm. I think is the biggest thing. Yeah. Um, so yeah, uh, but I just, I like I said, I, I wanted to take just a little bit of time and kind of explain that particular e- event, those events. Um, and I'm going to get us back on track for what you guys mm-hmm. all came for us tonight, and that will be truth to power. Um, Green chose not to ask a question because we don't want to, I don't know. I don't know how we would ask a question, to be honest. Um, so This... <laughs> 
it's a contentious <laughs> book. This book has actually caused more people pain than I think a lot of the lore that's come up. So I don't mind not asking the community a question on it because I feel like it would have been maybe contributing to some salt. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that's a that's a good. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, so that being said, we're going to just jump right into it uh, after our, our standard intro notes. In our last episode of Focus Fire Chat, we discussed the lore book Dust. If you enjoyed the show, please be sure to rate and, if you can, leave us a written review on iTunes or comment on the episodes on Podbean or whichever podcasting app you use to enjoy podcasts. Reviews are extremely helpful as they not only let us know what we can do better, but help continue to expand the FFC family, which allows more and more perspectives to be heard. To those of you who have already taken the time to leave us a review, thank you. As many of you already know, Focus Fire Chat is a gathering place where the intent is to offer a week-long, in-depth view of a particular subject from within game lore, with a special focus on Destiny. This chat begins every Tuesday morning and runs until the following Tuesday, with topics decided by the group via a poll that begins every Friday and ends on the Tuesday morning of the new chat. Every Friday, at around 10pm Central, we get together to stream a high-level summary of the previous week's chat for those who were unable to participate. If you're a fan of lore in all its various forms, be sure to also check out thelorenetwork.com, where you can find a wide variety of some amazing content that covers a number of different titles and mediums. This will also be the home for the Focus Fire Chat episode note archives and articles going forward. Our next chat is going to be a discussion on the symmetry. As usual, the plan is to set aside next week's discussion for a summarization of the extra lore content for May, Mortal Kombat. Before we jump into the information and thoughts that the community had about Truth to Power, however, let's have a quick chat about this week's Lost Lore. Uh, so this week, I mean, in the same way that Green was having kind of a, a confusion, I, I don't really have a, I don't know. I'm not, I don't, I'm going to just call it, I don't, I don't have a Lost Lore section. I had a lot of ideas about Lost Lore, like what we could do. Um, but I think honestly, the best way is going to be just to jump into Truth to Power because I think we're going to need as much time as we can get get Mm -hmm. to kind of do a a do justice to it um i'll be honest i i really i actually the the more i got into it the more i read it uh back to back and i i've read this book now i don't know probably close to 50 times um Mm -hmm. at least uh the more i read it and the more i kind of opened up uh, the different nuances of different things, even the parts that probably don't, who are probably Easter eggs, you know, if you will. Um, I actually really appreciate this book. I, I really like it, uh, but I had, but it was a book that I had to read multiple times before I got to that point. I totally understand if you've only like gone through a cursory glance of the book or even just a few pieces of it. Um, totally totally get the the frustration that is behind it um oh my it yeah. is it is a an enigma i believe is what is cole i think is what you refer to it as yeah um oh man so basically a good a good quote here for this one is uh from the earlier pages it says i can only slip these letters into the queen's gifts when the stars are right you will have to wait for my next and with it the beginning of the truth but i swear to you on whatever trust i've earned in your mind that at the end of this at the end of my story you will know who i truly am and i think that you know there's there's a conversation that we could have um and i'm going to try to not have it because i don't want i don't really want to have it uh about the reasoning from a mechanic standpoint as to why we only get one page every three weeks uh every, there there's a lot of people who have opinions on that and if you want that opinion i you know i would go go have go find those um from a story perspective this is why this is why we can only get every a page every three weeks is because 
the manner of delivery is embedded in the same, <clears throat> excuse me, in the same concept as what we were getting with stolen intelligence. These are coded into particular gifts to our guardian. Um, and those gifts are only given to us every three weeks. So from a lore standpoint, that's, that's where the explanation for why you can only get truth, the power from the particular source. That's why that is. Um, we receive this series of entries from an entity who actually initially claims to be Eris Morn, uh, but then proceeds to spin a web of half-truths and even fortright lies and the revelation of information that is claimed to be concerned about the underlying truth of the events taking place within the Dreaming City. So this is going to be very connected to the Dreaming City, uh, the curse of the Dreaming City, uh, connected to the three-week time loop that we as players and guardians experience while interacting with the secretive location of the Awoken of the Reef, the entries do seem to, in some small way, hold truths concealed within the fabrications. The challenge is, of course, that we are going to get into is which ones are which. What is the truth? What is a lie? What's what's actually fact? What's actually not? Like there's There's a lot of that still out there. Um, even with the revelation from secret or uh, stolen intelligence, that doesn't necessarily negate the entire entry, uh, which I think is important too. And ultimately, this question is also addressed by the figures within the entry, uh, revealing the conceptual source of another of the Hive siblings' powers. This is the idea of Imbaru. Uh, the, so, the supposed source of Savathun's power, which goes a long way in both explaining the in-game events as well as a nice nod by the writers towards the habitual obsessing over the information we're given as players in the lore community. Um, mm -hmm. And so a huge early shout out to Seth and uh, Malozy for this book. Like this book is... I, I, this book makes my head hurt. It does, but it's a... I, I, I appreciate it. Like I, I like I said, mm -hmm. I I really encourage people um, to go through it with a fine tooth comb and just take it as it's presented. Like don't don't try to connect it. Like the first couple times, if you just set aside, like don't go into it being like this book is you know bad or you know whatever. Just just read it. Just go onto Ishtar and read through it. It's going to be confusing. I get that, but just read through it a couple times. And then just kind of start, just read it and kind of feel what's actually going on in each of the entries. Um, I, I don't know. Like, I as I did that more and more, I actually really started appreciating some of the minor nuances that was going on in it. Um, but Green, I didn't know before we kind of dived in to the first book or the first entry. Was there anything I missed that you wanted to? Um, when you go into this book, this book is... If you're doing the cursory read, just don't don't approach the book with a fine tooth comb the first time you read through it. The, it this is just like my pre, like pre warning. Don't try to pick it apart the first time through because you're going to be utterly frustrated because of the way that these this book is put together. Because each card successively does not build necessarily upon the prior card, so it's very frustrating if you're trying to read one card dissect that card, read the next card, dissect that card, read through the whole thing, then go back through and try again. That is my personal, personal opinion on that one for sure. Beyond that, I think we should start with, is it you? Yes. And really quick, Cole, have you had a chance to read any of Truth to Power? So I actually read it through today, uh, start to finish for the first time ever. And I have notes. <laughs> Yes. Yep. Do you have, we chatted about. Do you have questions? Yes. Um, I will here and there. <laughs> You're but like, I'm pretty I'm just sure. Freaking confused in my, general. <laughs> well, no, actually, I'm not confused. Nice. I actually have a very solid theory on the whole thing, which is going to be far different from what both of you have. Because mm -hmm. yeah. Green's already she, heard it. She, she, yeah, she kind of. Uh, we'll go there. We'll get there. <laughs> Let's go. Charge. <laughs> Yeah, let's do this. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, so is it you? Is the is the introduction? Uh, it's basically it seems to be an introduction from uh, Eris, and that's kind of the question that I think is 
I kind of want to say it's the red herring or the red herring of the whole thing is like everyone's kind of getting focused on this this idea of like oh it's Eris no it's not Eris it's Eris and it's in this debate. Um, mm-hmm. I, well, I mean, I, and I you, see why like, it is, but right. I mean, it, let's dive into like what the the card entails itself. It has not only does it have the claim of it being Eris, which you find out towards the. Well, you can kind of find out at the beginning because of the reference to the queen Mm -hmm. and everything. But there's a story that she starts to tell towards the end about Arisa, uh, Russian name, Russian name, because I can't remember it off the top of my head. But the other thing that you find in this card in particular is you start to see the peeking through of what appears to be a code, which becomes important in the second card. Uh, the other thing is that line I think you mentioned at the very beginning where I can only slip these letters into the queen's gifts when the time is right or when the star is right, stars are right. I mean, that seems fairly significant. The fact that that can only get to us through Mara's throne world every three weeks. Yes. Um yeah, and I think this is the one that a lot of people get snagged up on with regards to in connection to stolen intelligence, which is where um, we find out that... Mm-hmm. Eris says she's not the writer. Well, Eris says that she's or, not the writer, and uh, Finchurch yeah. mentions that they have quote-unquote pictures of Eris from when she was a child in the last city, so... We kind of have a disconnect going on here about, you know, okay, so that that part is not true, which if you read this particular thing, um, the notes that I kind of have called out here is <clears throat> we have, you know, presented with the story of the Erisia, uh, which is a really interesting kind of odd or kind of nod uh, to what's going on in the 22nd century. Uh, I I don't know. It, it's hard to kind of put a lot of validity to that particular claim, given what we have in Stolen Intelligence from Finchurch. Um, but the, the other thing that kind of I kind of peaked or perked up on was the idea that she refers to ex-guardians who have escaped the traveler's occlusion often remember their first life clearly. Uh, my first, my initial question was, okay, what situations do we have as character as as guardians were what do we have to kind of back that claim up i mean we only have a very limited number of guardians that we're aware of in game that have uh quote escaped the traveler's occlusion which seems to be have their ghost killed uh those two would be shen and toland and shen is a terrible example for this particular front because shen didn't really have a first life uh, because with the Confession of Hope, we know that Shin was co- converted to a guardian pretty early on when he was a, like pretty much a toddler. So his memory of his life is intact simply because his life was his second life. He never had a first life. Um, Toland, well, it, it it's Toland. We don't... <laughs> It's like, I'm like, I don't know it, That's a fair. better defense. Um, and, and to kind of unpack that a little bit, we're not, we're just not really sure. Uh, he has yet to mention any memories from his first life, but given his obsession with how he is kind of an ethereal figure within the ascendant realm, it's also really not clear if he even cares about, I mean, like if he has memories of his first life, it strikes me as he's probably doesn't even care about it. Like that's not so he he has not made any comments about that so that claim uh, that claim is hard to validate with the information that we have right now uh, because simply there is not enough information to hold it up against um, now given with the stolen intelligence kind of st- taking a step back uh, given the stolen intelligence piece and then also given what happens in will you smile which is the next one. It kind of begs the question of, okay, this isn't actually Eris, right? Um, well, this is... Okay. I have... Yeah, go for it. Before we get too deep into this one, I have a lot of questions. Because this one makes my head hurt a little bit in so much as the... In the in this card in particular, there is a breakdown of, quote unquote, the code, right? Mm-hmm. which we'll get into how, and I know Cole and I talked about this earlier a little bit, but how would a letter 
a physical letter be altered midway through? Like why why is there alterations midway through if it's a letter slipped into the the box during Starlight? Because in this card, she literally or they literally call out, um, oh oh no, your ghost is breaking my code too much. I guess I better stop trying to uh, mm-hmm. to hide it. So How, why why I guess how I know I hate when people do this, but I'm going to answer your question with a question. Uh, uh-huh. why are you thinking that this was a physical letter? Because of the the line in the first card where it talks about, I slip these letters, uh, I can only slip these letters into the queen's gifts when the stars are right. Right. So the thing too is remember that the gifts are ingrammatic, ingrammatically coded. Uh, communication, right. communication within destiny seems to take lines of digital communication via ingrams and ingrammatic code, uh, which... I have a whole growing theory about how that works, but um, the ingrammatic process is the encoding of different data within the uh, the matter of ingrams. And so when I read that, when I saw I can only slip these letters into the kiss, I didn't think, oh, it's an actual physical letter. I thought this is a mm. is, this is a um, uh, a digital, basically an email. That is embedded mm-hmm. inside the ingram, because the same as stolen intelligence, but, right? And stolen intelligence, then, a, stolen intelligence was a, basically a file that was appended to the data stream of the uh, the level up packages that we were given from Zavala. It's a passive thing, though. Um, you send like an email, you write the email, and then send it. Unless it's like a chat, well, a physical okay, chat. so like, how would? Um, Oh, gosh. Uh, No, it's not. Uh, Because the thing with digital mediums is that by nature, you can put... uh, Gosh, man. There's there's a reason why uh, phishing emails are a thing. Uh, Emails are not passive by any means. They are... They are not passive. Uh, They can appear passive. Uh, When you open up an email, there is a lot going on behind the scenes uh, that can Mm -hmm. actually do a significant amount of damage to your computer. Uh, It's one of the ways that a lot of uh, uh, attacks on firewalls actually bypass the firewall is that you open up an email. It has a worm program and it activates upon opening. Uh, There, there's a lot of times that we like i mean and the reason i know this is this is a huge thing that at my actual per, like actually my job uh because we work within the financial industry we are constantly having to be trained on how to handle this exact thing uh emails are one of if not the most common way that people will puncture or will get a foot in the door past mm-hmm. firewalls because what it does is you can piggyback code on top of emails that is unseen and when you open up an email uh, uh the the easy way to do this is by embedding a quote unquote picture um pictures have what's called metadata actually everything everything digital has metadata and that metadata can be repurposed to conceal snippets of code that when properly activated or combined with other things will then create a, a Trojan horse or a, a virus for, uh, for that individual to then activate from outside. And so when you're talking about a digital means of tra- a digital means of communication, it's not a surprise to me that there is code embedded because remember and again, this whole thing if it's a di- if if it's a digital communication piece the whole thing is actually code like you guys everyone sees sees just text on the screen but anytime you see text on the screen that's just a ui uh ui or ux presentation of the code that's underneath right there there is always mm-hmm. going to be metadata there's always going to be uh you know, pick your language. JSP is a very common one. JavaScript is a very common one. Uh, Velocity script is another very common one with the everything kind of moving onto the web today in our in real life. Uh, if you're ever, you know, curious about this, if you're in like Google Chrome or uh, Internet Edge or any of the newer browsers, you can right click and there should be an option to inspect. If you do that, it will crack open the or it will expose the public very the public v- options of that particular uh, code 
and you can actually see what I'm talking about. You can see all the metadata that is going on behind the scenes. Um, you know, an easy way to do this is like on the TWAB. If you do that, if you really like that header, you know, that's the easiest way to actually snag that header. So you inspect the header, it'll tell you the exact location of that particular image. Not, not only will it tell you the exact location of that image, it will tell you the location of that image on Bungie's uh, server. And so mm-hmm. if you can back tra- and so and and you know that being said if you are not going to have the necessarily the best intent you can use that information then to backdoor or strong arm your way into a server not saying that Bungie is I mean I'm sure Bungie has a firewall against that specific attack I'd actually be surprised if they don't but that is how you gain you can gain access to different things is you can inspect it you grab the metadata you manipulate that metadata send it back you know and bam you got to you got to weigh in so mm-hmm. when you're talking about the communication as being like embedded in here the reason why i was kind of imagining this as an ingrammatic data stream is because exactly what you're saying the goat when you when you see will you smile when the ghost is like when she makes the comment about the ghost scrubbing it and stuff like that, it's right. Which I find absolutely, it was one of the things I actually found funny about this um, because ghost, we always made fun of ghost for his kind of fat fingering his way through code. And this is a nod to ghost actually doing really well with decoding things. Now we can go down the rabbit hole if, if that's, actually what's going on or if it's another lie that's being layered in but that's why i am inclined to think i i am right there with you actually i i think that this was an entirely intentional uh entirely intentional but um you know the whole thing with the medusa uh presentation of craft mind and concept like that um that's actually why i actually picked up as this as a digital communication and not a physical letter because again, even even within the Dreaming City rewards, we get an ingram from that. We don't actually get. Right. We don't actually. Because that's the thing is, like, even though you pull a you know X gun or piece of armor, even though we get that physical item, we decoded that ingram to achieve that item or to acquire that item. That was a decoding in process that you actually don't see. Anytime you pick up a item in in the world of Destiny, it's always going to be presented initially as an engram, and then when you pick it up, if it's a you know a blue, a green, or even some purple engrams, actually even exotics now in Destiny Two, <clears throat> um, we already can decode those on the fly. Uh, that was right. that was something that I actually I I really like having us being able to do that because it kind of gives a nod to our guardian and our ghost, uh, right, I, I would nod more towards the ghost, uh, kind of learning the, the ins and outs of decrypting cryptology of that concept. Okay, okay we should... I know that's going to tie into <laughs> stuff later on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, I mean, right. It's no, no, s- it's it's a huge... But, it, I mean, it does... It, right. It, this, this entire thing, the concept, I, I would... When you get done reading through it, I know I know I've we've kind of said don't read through it with information in your bracket, brain, but like the concept of malware is a huge component of this entire book. Like right. that entire concept is very important, especially as you get in the later portions, because it is pr- it is this is a book that is malware. Like this is basically malware. That's how it's being presented. Um, and we've seen multiple books being presented that way. Stolen Intelligence was actually a case of malware. Uh, Anor hacked the feed for rewards, and that's how she was uh, giving out that information. She had appended it to the end of the ingrammatic transfer of rewards to every guardian. Uh, so mm-hmm. it's not. This is not by any means a new way no, of seeing even all. though this technically came out before it stolen is, intelligence like it, the concept though is did. very similar it did so will you smile we find out or at least we sort of find out about medusa the card that broke the internet for a day <laughs> do you remember when this came out yeah. mm-hmm. back in de- what was it december uh s- was it december or was it september 
It was a long time ago. Uh, I think long it was time. September. It would have been... September 4th. Okay. I think is yeah. the history file on Ishtar says August 29th to September 4th, I think is the updated version. I think that's when it went into the API, but I don't think it released until later. That's fair, yeah. Because um, it was one of the locked ones. But Medusa. Cole, do you remember who Medusa was in this card? She is the supposed AI feeding this lie of Eris. But even then, I don't think Medusa is a real thing either. I really don't. Uh, Medusa, sorry. Medusa, the craft mind. Real quick, chat's updating us. November was when this one came out. See? Mm. Later than September. Hmm. Anyway. Craft mind, Medusa, AI. Why? What gives you the feel? Like, was there something in this card in particular that gave you the feeling that it was not actually an AI? Well, I mean, it gives off the appearance of an AI, but just the way some of it's done doesn't make sense. Like, for instance, there's actually a part of programming language, or is that in the next, it's actually in the next card. But um, uh, you would think that an AI would be smarter than it is if mm-hmm. it's trying to hide something, said to be utterly blatant of, yes, I'm an AI. And if it actually was, it would see what Zavala had tried to do to Rasputin in D1 and now in D2, like, it would be smarter about being more careful about saying who it is. Now, granted, we wouldn't go running to Zavala or Akor or anything, but knowing the hidden, they probably already know. So I really don't think it's under AI. And even then, if it was, I'm pretty sure Rasputin would have killed her already. So I think it's something else entirely. That's fair. Is there anything in this card blue that you want to call out in particular besides the uh, oh, no. besides the obvious code? Um, so actually, devil's advocate for what Cole was mm-hmm. talking about. Um, I'm not going to weigh in on <clears throat> my thought as to far as if it's a lie or if it's a truth or whatever. I'm going to just talk about. It. You know, I'm just going to approach this as if this is just the only card, right? Um, the concept of craft mind is a fascinating. I absolutely love it. Uh, but B, the other thing is, is the actual description that they give of a craft mind would in fact answer Cole. I think your, your qualms about it being AI, because if you Mm. look at what a craft mind is, hang on real quick, uh, craft mind is an AI designed to be highly empathetic, empathetic, and it collects and analyzes human intelligence, similar to that of the militant defense of Rasputin. Medusa watches and collects data over the awoken and the dreaming city. It is a it is a repository of data regarding the the illogical component of the human existence, right? Uh, so it is mm-hmm. going to go off data that is. Whereas Rasputin is like facts, and um, Rasputin seems to be much more cold Numbers. cold logic. Uh, Medusa, as presented in here, as a craft mind, which is also a concept presented in here, um, is the emotional component, right? It's the emotional part of the ai spectrum if you will um so to me as a devil's advocate to uh to that to that point i think that would explain where you kind of get the oh well it's the illogical uh it's because this ai was designed if this is an ai was designed from the ground up to be an emotional ai which is a fascinating talk like th- that that's a tangent that is dangerous for me um mm-hmm. because it gets into the question of like what is emotion like how how do you you know how do you quantify that well you can't quantify it because it's a freaking emotion right you can't um but that is what the presentation of a craft mind is is this repository of emotional intelligence whereas with other ai units we kind of get this um uh factual in, uh, factual information it's really I, I think that's really cool um but i think that also kind of explains where you get the idea of like oh well this ai is not really good at the ai thing it's because by its nature it's explained as not being an ai that is focused on it being an ai it is literally an emotional repository of the information and cultural significance of events um and so I think that's where if you are looking at AIs as being super focused on a particular aspect, that would, to me, explain why this particular AI is not good at, you know, uh, subversion or not very good at, well, I would hesitate to say that. It's not very good at quote unquote line. Or is it? That's that's kind of the thing is like, again, 
if this is an is this is a, what we would refer to as an EQ AI, um, that in fact would also make a nod to is that necessarily you know truth? If anything, a AI that collects emotional intelligence, I would argue, would be more dangerous and more likely to be able to lie smoothly because they That's know it. they know how to manipulate your emotions. You know, and now, there's you know, does that does that make sense? Make. Does that make sense? It does. Okay. It does. It makes sense now. So, to actually bolden embolden your point so there is a line that says ai com slash medusa mm -hmm. far flung whatever there's a section there that says c3i now that's an actual real world term right. of military communication and uh command center so it could actually be a military ai that does go off emotions and catalogs and learns to manipulate through emotion because it's you know, psychological, and it's very, a very real thing. Mm -hmm. um, so that does help your point. But coming from my perspective, I still don't think it's Eris or an AI or anything. And when we get to the final card, I'll actually explain my theory right. on the whole thing. Yeah. So um, the other thing that I really like in this card is the explanation of how, of what Mara was doing uh, with the, with the present, the metaphor of judo. I really like that. Uh, was that Mara or Eris? No, it was Mara. Because, so, okay, so she uses Eris as an explanation for what Mara did to Oryx. Um, real okay. quick, let me see. Uh, so it says, royalty knows its own. When Oryx destroyed Mara's catch, he used his crowning weapon, the last and surest argument for his omnipotence. He extended the pocket universe of his throne world into our cosmos, and with it, he destroyed his foes. Whatever fell within it became subject to his will. He was the taken king, and he took. It was a death befitting a queen. And Mara did die, but she was not destroyed. And then she kind of jumps back. Before I was ever a guardian, I learned judo. I'm just going to cut out the, the interjection of code. Uh, before I was ever a guardian, I learned judo. Look at yourself, guardian. Look at the body you so recklessly destroy and recreate and destroy again. Will you try for me to become that body for a moment? Even an exo has a human's inter introception. Imagine that you have lost your ghost as I did. Feel your breath in the cask of your chest. Feel your pulse shuttling power from your lungs to your aching calves. Now imagine that I stand across from you in the fighting ring. I wear the loose, excuse me, I wear the loose whited belted robes of the judica. How strange. I find myself hoping that you imagine me with more human eyes. Imagine how we fight. You are strong in the light, an angel of strength and will. I am only a mortal woman, slow and soft. When I was Erisia in St. Petersburg, I cursed my own softness. But the principle of judo is that softness controls hardness. I might sidestep your hip and grip the passing arm, pulling my, putting my own power into that hit to strengthen the strike that strikes nothing and leave you off balance. By agility and surprise, I used the power of the blow for my own purpose. Thus the queen accepted Oryx's strike, and the power of his grasp became the invitation she required to step forward and up and into the realm of Oryx's throne where she went not as a victim, but as an infiltrator, trusting me to end orcs and leave her free in a domain of newly masterless, masterless power. If I throw, and that's when, uh, if I throw you to the mat, will you drag me down with you? Will you curse and fight? Mm -hmm. Will you smile? Um, so that's, that's again, that concept of uh, the deflection of power um, is that part is kind of in line with what we do see Mara actually doing with Oryx. Uh, and so that's where, and I really like that metaphor because that is a pretty accurate metaphor of using, uh, the, the process of the strike to do its own self damage. Um, it's very accurate and I like it. Um, so then it kind of goes into the whole concept of, then we start seeing the Gemini dyad, uh, code, uh, which I find that kind of interesting there as well. Uh, mm -hmm. dyad, you know, just to kind of break that apart real quick. There's a couple, they're just because it's interesting keywords. Um, dyad is something that consists of two parts or elements. Uh, Gemini is, uh, I mean, a lot of people will recognize the Gemini as the astrological sign. It's the third astrological sign. Uh, it involves the twin figures of Castor and Pollux. Uh, these twins are actually known in most mythology as the Disocuri. Uh, and I mean, there's just huge, huge 
stories about Castor and Pollux. Um, but the other thing about Gemini is that this sign is considered to be one of the most important in Zodiacs because it actually captures man's most basic level, uh, stemming from our concept of a dual nature creature. Uh, so we have both that, that idea that we have both lower and higher natures, basically. Um, and then the MSDA, that's where we get the concept of Medusa. Uh, there's actually a lot of different ways to take that. Um, Medusa is agreed in all myths that Medusa was a Gorgon. Uh, the origin and the creation story of Medusa varies in a lot of different things. Uh, for instance, Attic tradition uh, kind of presents Medusa as a, uh, a member of the Gorgons with uh, the references that she was one of the only mortal ones. And that was kind of, again, a consistent theme. Uh, Gorgons were presented as immortal. But because of Medusa not being a true Gorgon, she was actually one of the only, she was either one of or the only mortal Gorgon. Um, and Gorgons are the mythological creatures that have the ability to turn their opponents into stone by looking at them. Uh, some legends have Medusa with the very commonly seen hair of snakes. Uh, not all myths do. Uh, not all Gorgons have that. Medusa, that did seem to be a common thing with Medusa, and that was tied very closely to uh, the creation of Medusa. Um, and so, like, there, and, and really the story that a lot of people probably recognize with Medusa is the one from Metamorphosis uh, from Ovid. Uh, and that is where Ovid notes that Medusa alone has snakes for hair, and that is stemmed into the curse by Athena. Uh, within Metamorphosis, it is actually Medusa who trans, uh, who offends Athena. Uh, some stories will say that Medusa was a victim and that Athena was actually defending her. Uh, but the common thing is that the, the whatever, whichever the intent was, the source of, quote, the curse was basically her and Poseidon having relations in one of Athena's temples and in, in rage or in order to protect her from Poseidon, depending on which myth you're particularly reading, Athena curses her to become a Gorgon. And in punishment, because that point of fascination for Poseidon was her hair, there was a, a, a multiple comments about being enthralled by her golden hair. Uh, in punishment, Athena corrupts that and turns her hair into snakes. Um, yeah. And so, and then like given, you know, how far down that mythological rabbit hole you want to go. You have Hesiod and Theogony or Theogony. Um, you have the Attic tradition. Different different legend sources have slightly different variations of the particular myth. But the most common one that a lot of people will recognize is the Metamorphosis myth. Um, there's actually a very interesting alternative to that myth uh, that is in another podcast called Mythology that I really would recommend people giving a listen to. Um, it's very, very well done. But uh, just really, f that was just kind of a connection. Uh, there's not really a connection between Medusa and Eris within mythology. I know that was a... Can I make a side note? Yeah. Yee. So real quick, Medusa is quote unquote a Gorgon. The only time we ever see that term in mm -hmm. Destiny is the Gorgons in Vault of Glass mm -hmm. who have a death stare. Just want to side note that for a later point in the topic <laughs> yes no yeah and that's and that's uh, a, another connection too to be made um the vex do tend our our labeling of vex units is very greek mythological uh you know you'll we've we've made that comment before about the different different alien npc species having a very nuanced or very specific naming convention you know the cabal have mm -hmm. the cabal have the the roman esque naming convention the vex have the greek mythology fallen kind of have this like uh pirate concept hive or very dark fantasy like, like there's there's very specific pillars of community or very specific silos of labels that are given to each one. And I don't think that's by mistake that we see Medusa being brought in because of exactly what you're saying right there is that, that nod to the <laughs> Gorgon. Um, yeah. And, and uh, again, I know it was like around the time that this card came out, I know one of the big questions that at least I was seeing is like the connection between Medusa and Eris. And it's like, mm -hmm. Honestly, there's not there, there's not any. 
Um, like, I mean, maybe there was a, maybe there, depending on, depending on the myth myths, right. Yeah. Cause myths are fun like that. They're oral tradition. So of course everyone's different, but like I could see maybe a connection, a very small connection between Eris in mythology and the Gorgons, but it's not very prevalent. Um, to be honest, those, those two particular stories didn't ever really cross paths. Should we move into the Medusa card itself with its uh, seven different itemized designations that are going on? Yes. So in this card itself, it's the first of the quote-unquote Medusa cards. It has the header on it that we have figured out with the Gemini Dyad that Blue was talking about earlier with the C3I that Cole was mentioning earlier. And it reads very interestingly in the fact that it has seven different quote unquote paragraphs or designations or um, assertions within this card. And it is Medusa apologizing for her deception a little bit. It talks about how the Taken got to the uh, Dreaming City through the Ascendant Realm after Oryx's uh, demise during the raid. And through there, it kind of continues to talk about it, and it designates designates two different problems that it wants to figure out. Uh, and it comes at number four. It says, I determine with good confidence, three sigma, that Oryx is dead. The Taken here became directionalist and scattered until the death of the Antipath- Antipathic predator Riven opened the city to massive Taken assault. Why? I will code code this as problem one. Second problem. Five. The Guardian counterattack against Duel and Karu, whose thought pierced like needles, triggered the ongoing causal loop. Why? How? I will code this as problem two. So in this card, it's mostly Medusa trying to figure out how to function more like Rasputin does, in so much as trying to decide what's going on and how it's happening and trying to apologize and whatnot of her previous previous things blue diving into this i didn't find too much personally in here on this card in particular that really stuck out to me but is there anything that you or cole thought was important uh <clears throat> yeah, no, I, I the summary of the two problems is the primary importance. Uh, the other thing that was predominant in this particular entry uh, was, again, you know, taking taking the debate whether or not this is factual events out. The uh, the mm-hmm. thing to keep in mind is that she makes the comment that while she is collating data to address these particular questions, the two questions that you had just mentioned, um the fact of the dreaming city's importance is something that is undeniable to the craft mind. So within this particular entry, she refers to again, dreaming city is of utmost importance. Uh, We'll get, I think it's in the next card that that kind of gets brought up again too, but that is something that was also kind of present. I can't remember if that was presented in so many words, but um, Mm -hmm. it was something that she did stress or it did stress heavily. But yeah, no, the the problems really, which, I mean, again, we kind of see, um, <clears throat> we see, I don't think I had anything. Sorry, I'm just flipping notes real quick. Um, I don't think this was the one that had the Easter egg. Uh, no, that's later. I think that's, the one with the, the marathon yeah, Easter egg. Yeah, the marathon Easter egg, yeah. Yeah, that's, that's later. later, right? That's later. Um, yeah, it's... Uh, Kalia yeah. or Kalia? Kalia. Yeah. Yeah, Kalia. That's later. Yeah, okay. Um yeah, I mean like I I think the the other thing here that I would note is that <clears throat> it does present a very biased presi- presentation or insofar as there is a lot of supposition going on even within this card. I do like that actually because uh like for number t- uh, point number 2 uh, is my best guess it's just, that's the very entry is like it's presenting this as like hey look this is what i think is going on um i like that because first off it doesn't line up with what we pretty much think is what happened uh given the information that we have elsewhere uh but this would be how outside of the knowledge that we have someone else having they're assuming the the flow of what brought the taken into the dreaming city 
um i kind of i i appreciate that i like that kind of little hey you know not everyone has the information you have as a guardian and this is how you can deduct this happening if you don't have that information is kind of how i took it but yeah basically medusa is just the situation report on the hive presence within the dreaming city and the potential problems that they have there cole i'm gonna hand it to you so there's two other things i want to notate in this card um one is it's called the sit rep on hive presence but there's also mm-hmm. a mention of the sky shock arrays which the only point in time we actually do anything with those is back in d1 where right. you had to protect the control panels and that was a hive mission mm-hmm. so i find it rather interesting and that it's kind of like hearkening back all the way there yeah and right. then the sky shock was also a connection to the taken as well mm-hmm. yeah sky shock event the black and white yeah events the career uh, mm-hmm. Karia. Mm-hmm. yeah yeah Korea. oh god the debates of the, that uh, uh-huh. <laughs> the second thing I want to note is, like, we learned that this whole thing is a lie, that, you know, Aerith is a lie and all that. Um, so already we're forced to take a step back and analyze everything that's being told us, because now we're trying to figure out, is it real, is it a lie, and so on and so forth. Mm-hmm. But in the zero section, whoever it is is asking, are you well? Does anyone anywhere ask after your wellness? You've done so much. I hope you have friends, <laughs> not just people who send you on errands. Now, to me, that's now planting a seed of, I would say, almost resentment. Planting because doubt. Because, yeah, now you're, you're looking like, do I actually have friends? Mm-hmm. But now this thing is asking me if I'm well. So, so I think there's like a little seed going on right there. Well, and that goes back to what you were saying about the uh, C3I, right? Mm-hmm. And the, the, subver- the subversion of, of that. Yep. Yep, that's all I got though. Like, I just found it really interesting that that little seed is right there because it mm-hmm. had to put it in there. Oh yeah, no, and I, I think is. I think that highlights too a big part of what this entry is supposed to do. You know, mm-hmm. when when we were talking with uh, John, he kind of made the comment about that was his his entire purpose of kind of putting together Nezarak was it's like no, he's he exists to create theories. Like it's not it's not that there is like a, a master. I mean, I'm not going to say I don't think he ever went on the record saying that there wasn't a master plan for that particular character. But he's but he mm-hmm. he did say that you know half of the half of the the point is to actually make us as gamers think about things and and force us into situations where we're like we're not. I'm not comfortable saying that this is actual fact and this is this is not. You know, it's it's how do you keep you on your toes so i think also you know that again goes back to my my appreciation for this book is the fact that it does create uncomfortable like is this true is this not true is this you know you constantly are having to reevaluate the information within it i find that entertaining Mm -hmm. but i'm also i'm also an i'm also an intellectual masochist so you know (laughs) it's (laughs) To me, I, I I like the theory crafting and the the questioning of information and reevaluation that it, that this book does strongly well, strongly of that, that's present. That's next card. Mm-hmm. The next card is the card you were mentioning earlier. That is brave. There's so many mythological connections to this one too. Mm-hmm. Um. So, <clears throat> excuse me, man. Uh, this is a. This is a basically report on the cosmology of the Dreaming City. Um, so, th- I don't know, Green. You're better at summarizing them. I'm better. I feel like I'm going down too many you do, tangents. You do, yeah. You do in the in depth stuff. I get the summary type things. So let me pull up the actual card because right now I have just my notes on it. This card is two different events, two different messages that come in. Um, also a C3, C3I three C covert card. There are two different st- uh, miniature stories. Also uh, codes hidden within this these two cards, which drive me freaking crazy. So if you love breaking <laughs> codes, there are codes in this scattered throughout this book in lots of different ways. So the first one is another failed timeline. It's basically acknowledging the whole uh, three-week cycle in the first section and... 
talking about the Dreaming City, and I know Cole had some notes about this entry part in particular because it has a uh, coding coding thing, mm-hmm. and I'm sure, Blue, you have some, some fun things to go with this one. But uh, Medusa is going through and correlated the Awoken myth with onto cartography salvage from Oryx's Dreadnought. The original home of the Awoken still exists. Big news there. Distributary is still out there somewhere. Where? We don't know yet. Um, they're saying it's somewhere within the system, but we are not entirely certain. But they're they're saying somewhere around the sun, uh, singularity that orbits our sun. Doesn't say where at within the system, though. And there's no, she says, she acknowledges there's no way to reply to the message, but I'm an empathetic, I'm an empathic, empathic and feeling machine, vulnerable to loneliness. So this is another call out from the craft mind aspect. Then message two, Medusa has a brain stain alert. I'm not, and she freaks out because essentially what's going on is there is a point where um, the, who is it? I don't remember which bad guy it is, is essentially trying to break into it. Uh, There's a mention of Aleph and, let's see, a Riven. The ontological, ont- ontopathic predator, the, the chimera, which has Riven your desires from your God, yeah, it I feel like here. there's a code in there. There is. It is. And it's literally, read just the first, the words with the first capital letter. Riven desires your intents. It wanted you here. Oh, okay. Yeah, I overthought that. Yeah, it's a lot more simple than most people think. Um, yeah, there's another code as well. There's more within that than what is just said straight up. But um, there are some breakdowns in the encryption, it looks like. Neurofatal signal subjectivity degloved. Mind state unable to continue. Panic. Illegal causality event during associative access into training data. Date is not a legal time address. Please help me if you can. I don't want to be a bother. AI Medusa freeze and dump kill state to AI live slash slash morgue. No response from remote remote server. Dump failed. So it sounds at the end like Medusa is freaking out. She's postulating more about the Awoken Society and also pushing a coded message out to us through this then freaking out because she's not able to actually dump the information into wherever her stores are. Mm -hmm. And she freaks out in this card throughout it. Beyond that, summarizing it, um, there's a lot of information about the, the raid, the raid groups in here. Can you imagine the unified will of six elite god slayers wishing for a single thing, which was her destruction purification? Can you imagine how she feasted upon you? Basically, she's calling out the fact that we're the one feeding Zabathun or Duel and Karu. Long summary for that one, but it's it's there. Blue. Okay. Um, so, yeah. Thetis Brave. Uh, so, there's a couple things that it stood out to me. Uh, mention of the cycles being separate timelines was made here. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, basically, every three weeks is referred to as a different timeline, <clears throat> which is... Interesting. Uh, The story of Achilleus is mentioned, which will tie into the actual name of this uh, particular card. Uh, Thetis is actually Achilleus's mother. Uh, Now, as mentioned, there are different versions. Um, The version of the story of Achilleus that is mentioned here is actually written by a author, a a author known as Statius. It was actually in the first century AD. It stems from the Achilleid. And uh, the the reason why that is important is that actually the earlier versions of the myth of Achilleus uh, don't hold the general view of the hero being invulnerable. Um, So the concept of Achilleus as being a uh, invulnerable 
mortal was actually not in place until the first century AD. Uh, so you see in the Iliad, for example, by Homer and that era of stories, uh, Achilles is actually constantly being wounded. Uh, in the Iliad, for example, he is wounded at the elbow in a fight uh, near the, the river Scamander. Um, his death actually is not, as most people think, the, Ach- the Achilles heel, if you will. Uh, the actual death in earlier versions of the myth was actually him getting struck in his chest by arrows. Uh, it wasn't until later renditions of the Iliad and the retelling of those stories post uh, the Achilleid being uh, widely published that we see the concept of him getting shot in the heel. Um, this is also, so that's just an interesting little tangent there for me. Um, this also is where we get a Easter egg with Marathon, which I know was not a huge surprise for a lot of Bungie fans. Um, but the mentioning of Kalia is a direct and overt nod to the games of Marathon. Uh, mm-hmm. Kalia was one of the moons that was orbiting the planet Lahoana, um, which was the home of the Sefikur, uh, which was a tribe of the Sefit, uh, which were NPC class or NPC race. Um, now the Sefikur were the tribe. It was it was called considered the eleventh tribe of the Sefit, and they abandoned Lahoan after a, just a, a massive brutal war with the other tribes, and they actually took up residence on Kalia. And then a thousand years about following that particular departure, they had been forgotten on Lahoane. and Yarrow was another big bad in the game actually set that moon adrift so he actually kicked that moon out of the orbit and they just vanished well in in marathon two and marathon infinity there is a particular event that is going on and the entire one of the entire concepts of that particular game is the liberation of the civet uh because they were aliens who had been against their will, cybernetically enhanced in order to terraform Lahoane. Uh, and so Lahoane is the primary location for the majority of Marathon 2 and Infinity. Um, so there, that's that's why the Sefit are so integral to this particular story. Uh, but there is a character who goes by the name of Thoth, and it is during the events of Marathon 2 and in Marathon Infinity, which during the liberation by the Marine and Durandel, Thoth actually recalls Kalia back. Um, but the point that I would also make here is that we actually don't know if inside the games as they exist for Marathon currently, we don't know if Kalia actually ever made it back. It has been recalled, which is where the nod here in Thetis Brave, um, <clears throat> which I believe is number... What was that? Uh, God, I just blanked on which part was. But she calls. She basically says, I am like Kalia and I'm being recalled. Uh, number one on the first portion. She says, the Dreaming City was built in imitation of a greater world, a wonder lost to the Awoken but not forgotten." Like wandering Kalia, which I, uh, which I am called summoned home. Uh, so that that is that entire connection there. Um, and then the other thing here is we get a a claim, air quotes here, a claim of the true purpose of guardians, being the discovery of the distributary. Uh, so this is and keep that in mind because that's going to be mentioned later. Um, and then also, <laughs> I love this one. Uh, this is going to tie into the concept of Imbaru, but there does, in my mind, when I read this, I read this as a nod to the lore community and the desire of Medusa that guardians gather and discuss her words, origin, and location with others and obsess over those facts. Like, I find that, I found that pretty, I, I kind of chuckled when I read that. Yeah, there's a lot of nods to that. Oh my god, when we get when book. we get into Imbaru, ah. Uh, uh-huh. Imbaru is like a huge I don't know if it's an F you or a good job keep doing it. 
Like I just I think it's a little I bit I think of it both. is too, but oh my, I love I love it. I love the concept of Imbaru. Um but yeah, so I think that's where today this this particular one I think is the start of that we're kind of getting introduced to the concept that will later be defined as Imbaru. But Cole, I didn't know if I missed anything. Uh the only thing I want to notate um is actually a continuation of, of conc- I can't even say this term concatenating code, which if you look up at what was it? Number one, mm-hmm. like Wandering Kalia, which I, and then it has that weird ampersand and underscore, right. mm-hmm. and it continues on. That's actually a, a, a real code in, in real life um, of going from one string to the next. So like, hello world, which is <laughs> the first practice code that people do. It, it kind of <laughs> gives a nod to that. I forgot hello world. It's just kind of weird that it's suddenly there. So it looks like it's like going back to decoding all these pages as we get them um it looks like this ampersand and underscore is a disruption somewhere but then it's also smack dab in the middle of connecting destiny to marathon mm-hmm. which so might be a it's, nod it's there a, too is st- which stop also connecting us, the two <laughs> which also gives us the dyad which has been mentioned mm-hmm. twice before. So it's literally two parts coming together. Oh, so. Marathon and Durandal. How you vex me so often. Yeah. So that's what I want to notate that. It's because Bungie doesn't write just random stuff for nothing. It's got to be there for a reason. Yeah. And I so. think the other the other thing, too, with the connection that I was seeing with Marathon with the Savit is the the entire purpose of their existence was to terraform a world for their overlords and you can kind of argue that that was in this in the paradigm that is presented within these entries you can argue that that's also similar to the awoken's creation uh with their their entire process on the distributary right is if they were created which they they were created um you know, was that in the same line as the Sfit from from Marathon, where were they created to mm-hmm. create a particular world and a you know, and that kind of ties into again the whole concept of Imbaru. Is were they created to further that? You know, I mean that's that's starting to be the question that forms with with that particular thought process or thought exercise. Well, losing the moon is much like losing the colony ship, mm-hmm. and then they're suddenly something they weren't before. So. And then they were called home to, you know, and yeah, I mean, mm-hmm. there's there's a lot of connections I think that you could be make that I that we could make with those particular things too. But we'll be here all night. Yes, and I want pancakes. yes, and and Cole wants pancakes, <laughs> so let's let's choose let's let's choose how to act and react. Yes. Hmm. <laughs> So, this is Green's. Choose, this is Green's. Your, this is Green's favorite oh card ever. These two, <laughs> the two that are the choose your own adventure. I am like. Well, to be fair, Green, it's more than two. It's pretty much every card after this up yeah, until React. I know. Like these are just the bookends. I would argue. Uh, I really think that yeah. most of the cards between these two are actually still parts of the choose your adventure. The LSD, I, LSD okay. the card. Oh man, yes. I also might have made Green uncomfortable with that part too. Yeah. Oh my god. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So, if you are a fan of the Choose Your Own Adventure books, where if you go, if you choose this choice, go to this part of the book. That is this card. Um. God. There's everything. It leads to the same in- ending, but it starts with you experience a vivid hallucination. You are standing in the courtyard of the tower. You are without armor or weapons, and your senses seem more vivid than usual. <laughs> Under your tongue is a taste of salt. Blue broke me because of his notes on this card. She, um, I get a message from Green. She's like, I have questions and lots of concerns. <laughs> right. <laughs> because his note on this card mentions the date rape drug. And I'm like, how... How 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 do you know about this, Blue? Because I, I exist in the world. I, I didn't even know about that. So That's the thing. Is like there there's to to put into context the creepy thing that she just said. Um, the reason why I brought that 
logic in is there's very few hallucinogens that also are connected with the concept of the taste of salt. Uh, GHB or gamma hydroxybutyrate, which is also known as the date rape drug or a club drug, is one of the few. I believe LSD is there's some variants of LSD that will also do this, but GHB is very commonly ascribed to having a salt like taste if it's taken by itself. Um, this is not to be confused with roofies. Roofies is a completely different other chemical makeup. Um, similar con similar effect, but not as fun, I guess, because GHB <laughs> GHB actually, if you if you don't o like not OD, but if you don't over imbibe with GHB, it is actually will actually induce hallucinations. Um, now there's a fine line, and that's where you get the difference between club drug and date rape. Like there's there's a there's mm -hmm. a difference there. Um, but GHB, what it is, is it's a central nervous system depressant that actually does include among its. I love the the website that I was looking at. It's like the positive side effects and the negative side effects. I'm like, no, nah, no, nah, that's that's gonna be. There's no positive. Th this is that. this is gonna be all in the latter and should not be in the former. That's just my personal opinion there. Um, obviously, whatever. Uh, but GHB does include among its effects the experience of vivid hallucinations. Uh, the connector here again is that it is one of the very few hallucinogens that has the salty tinge and flavors. Uh, other CNS depressants, uh, which would include roofies uh, and that that ilk, those tend to be flavorless, which is why they're so dangerous. Uh, you know that's why that's why it's so uncomfortable to talk about them is because you won't know. Mm -hmm that you have been roofied you won't know that whereas with ghb if you if you're not drinking a strong drink i guess uh and someone tries to slip you ghb and you're paying attention you do have a bit of a aha moment there's a red flag going on i did not put salt in this drink um yeah, I don't know how I'm going to recover from that statement. So anyways, just moving on. Right. Uh, that's where the so, connection here is. So basically, what I messaged Green right. was, hey, look, <laughs> the chat. Thank you for listening to Street Smarts, the podcast with your host, Blue. <laughs> I just, yeah. so I just, like, the funny, the reason I just, I, I die laughing because I just watched uh, John Mulaney's uh, uh, Radio City, and he has an entire skit about Street Smarts, which is freaking hilarious nice. but um no so the reason why i kind of brought this up was i was like this is entirely the case that her guardian has been right. roofied <laughs> like, right. it's like and hey it's, it's, if you didn't know it from the the thing at the very top the speaker has been replaced with a hydra <laughs> um there are other things that are obviously like Cade. major Cade. major problems. Cade's dealing out What's... cards, and he's like, "I just not. Uh, they keep it. So they doomed. keep me from Nessus. <laughs> they have an. They have a copy yeah. of me on Nessus." I was like, "Yeah, this is a really fun trip down the memory lane of acid trips." Apparently. Mm hmm. Uh, gosh, yeah. It's this also takes place back in D one. Mm -hmm. Which is this, weird because this, the confluence uh, the confluence there is also disconnected because with Kate he mentions Nessus, but it's on the right. original tower. So yeah, there's because Eris is also there, mm -hmm. and you get to play soccer with Eris, mm -hmm. which is also weird. There's also mentions of killing Riven in this card and Medusa. Like you bring Medusa before Rahul. Ah, oh, he sniffs. Another battle trophy. <laughs> Pre-collapse, post-foreboding. <laughs> a covert intelligence designed to watch over a high-risk colony mission. Allow me to decrypt her for you. It's like, oh, God. Rahul getting a hold of Medusa? No, thank you. I'm sorry. I, like, yeah. There's something I want to say. How did he know what to do with her? I'm, I, I right? have an answer to that, but I'm not going to say it on the podcast because there is actually, That's there is actually, dark. there is actually an answer to that. Um, oh, from no. a, from a idle bark that he had in D1. So keep that in your back of your mind. Um, there, and I kind of mapped out the choice path for this entry. Uh, Pretty much the true ending seems to be A. Uh, there's a few other, like, nuanced individual things. Uh, a, like, choice A 
if you kind of go down the path and look at it i do like the the call out that if you read them down the list someone there's there's one of them that makes the comment of like if you're reading these down the list you see things that like a vex <laughs> and i was like i'm like mm-hmm. yeah totally like, oh yeah, yeah. no I, I did too because i was i was making the the choice path and i saw that and i was like <laughs> i like that <laughs> like, i like the little like we know what you're doing <laughs> but um the question that is predominant and has some disturbing implications, especially, is the question that is asked in step I. Uh, and it says, guardians make their own fate, but what if the process by which they decide upon their own fate could be understood and manipulated? Which is akin to what we actually see with like the Saint-14 situation. Um we're also seeing it in these cards. Correct. Yeah, it's 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 trying to <laughs> understand the paracausal nature of guardians to in order to manipulate that abilities. Mm-hmm. Um, which, again, going into Cole, I'm going to go back to the C3I is again, you know, subversion of intel intelligent uh, assets is something that seems to be very prevalent in this okay. entry. Yeah, because even with the lie about Eros and then saying they're Medusa and the C3I, and now we're given these choices, and we already have, you know, the seed of doubt slash resentment, and then the logic of, okay, what am I actually going to choose? Because we're taking emotion out of it, because now we know something's up. And in these first choices, they do bring up K, which, you know, people are still saying it's too soon it's too soon you know because he he died mm-hmm. whatever moving on um but then you also have the curiosity of medusa and handing her over to rahul so it's like do you choose with your heart with Cade, or do you go to rahul and figure out what medusa is which he wouldn't know what to do anyways or do you look at the other choices so really it's hearkening back to the c3i of you know who is figuring out what we're doing because it is just like the I option of guardians make their own fate but then it's also trying to manipulate us with these other choices Mm -hmm. so really it's a card feeding into itself and 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 the funny thing is is you say that because that's actually if you follow the choice path it's a cycle uh if Mm -hmm. you follow the choice path that actually ends with with a uh like if you walk through and it ends you end up back where you started um so it, it actually, if you start at A and you walk down the path, if like your choices will eventually lead back to A, they yes. all lead back to your starting point, um, which I find interesting in this in this card especially. The other thing I want to uh, point out though is uh, option K does say achieve light level 99 or 999. <laughs> yeah. Yep, and then yep. Anne says if you have 100 form. points. So it's not like, because we don't say light level in game. That nope. is purely just a mechanic thing. No one has ever said, oh, what's your light level? It's how powerful are you with the light? So really, this is a, a fourth wall break twice in the same card. Uh well I don't know if M was a full f- I wouldn't I would argue that M might not I would not say this because we don't have because unless we're talking about soccer that's, that's what I was gonna there's say nothing is like that's well that's <laughs> what I was gonna say is like if you technically play soccer you could get a hundred points I I kind of agree at the the can you though I've never seen a game go that high no you can play multiple <laughs> games you can it's play like, multiple games ah uh, and so like if you keep choosing I'm just like thinking. technically if you keep choosing the play soccer with Eris choice, you know, you can argue, I'm just playing devil's advocate there, but like, I, I could see an argument being made that you could actually get a hundred points. Um, and which, which would make more sense because the process or <clears throat> the path that M leads to is all about Eris. Uh, entry, entry X is, uh, an actual card that is uh, injection. It's an yeah, it's and an injection is a hundred percent about errors. So that's why I also kind of like when you get a hundred points, that's because you're playing soccer with errors so much that you play mm-hmm. you play you know however many games that would require. Last thing I want to note though is option L. The vex compromise your ghost. Your body releases itself into a pool of saline and slime, <laughs> and Matrix. your ghost delivers your soul to the axis mines 
Why would your ghost take your soul, which brought back from the dead, to the enemy? Who says they're the enemy? Me. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, Easy answer. I mean, I, I can... <laughs> <laughs> Again, devil's advocate is the whole concept of the ghost being, you know, the the techno technological wonder that it is. Um, I can see a lot of people making the argument, too, that that would connect to the Vex as well. I mean, just again, devil's advocate there. So as an XO. And also Cole going back. <laughs> sorry. Sorry. Just real quick. Also going back to your your comment about creating doubt. If you if yeah. you all of a sudden now are looking at your ghost as a potential threat from the Vex, you know, hey, guess what another side effect of most hallucinogens are? Paranoia. Mm-hmm. I mean, yeah. so there's, to me, that it was just kind of a... But yeah, sorry. As an XO... As an XO, because that's all I ever play, uh, I don't want somebody else touching my coded soul. That's just gross. Listen, Deep Stone. T- just keep you. Keep your fingers out of my soul. Keep your fingers out of my code. Is that what I'm hearing? Yeah. Yeah. So Cole, Cole's not a now. fan of the long whisper is what I hear. Nope. Mm-mm. Oh, I still want to know more about that one. <laughs> I do too. I just want to know what's on enchilada. Enchilada? Pulled pork. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh. Yes. I'm writing that down. <laughs> That's amazing. <laughs> Uh yeah, so uh the the outstanding one is I and then M, which will lead to actually injection if you guys want to jump onto that particular one. Okay. So injection is Dual and Karu in the Dreaming City, essentially, and kind of the supposed purpose there. Uh let me pull up the actual card again. That the notes are pretty this one's just such a creepy card. Too. I'll be honest. It starts out I, with I, a, I had a. Do you want to read it? I had a completely Doctor Who vibe with this whole particular card. Oh, really? oh yeah, because one of the the oh gosh, it just blanked on her name. But one of the reoccurring side characters is a slab of skin moisturizing me. Oh, she's yeah. like the last. Oh, yeah. She's less the last. Like the even, it's Rose. Second. It's the one yeah. with Rose. It's the, the the arc with Rose. But it's uh-huh. moisturize me. <laughs> I was like, because there's the uh-huh. description. Their that. description of uh, Eris is being stretched out. I'm like, all I can see is moisturize me, <laughs> like, mm-hmm. which made it distinctly <laughs> less creepy than I think it was intended to make it. But to me, it made it funny. Um, oh my gosh, it's such a creepy thing. But it starts out with Eris Morn's body twitches and folds. The sweat on her brow swarms back to her pores and burrows in like glistening larva. Suddenly there is a sound like a single bone struck upon a metal plate. And in the dark interval between two firework detonations, the body loses all structure, falls loosely upon itself like a rag drifting in water, tumbles and snaps, suddenly flat and taut into a pain of leather and skin moisturize me the, the... <laughs> see it makes it it makes it so less creepy <laughs> though that pain comes a long black needle or through that pain comes a long black needle and the skin around it dimples into the erratic spun cancer topology of some gruesome four-dimensional waveform which no monist process could ever produce yeah it's super creepy. yeah i can't i can't redeem that part sorry that's beyond it's that's beyond creepy. my Doctor um, Who jokes. But it's like okay, so we have these cards back in D one that were the torture scenes. Um, oh god, the Omar torture scenes of the wizards. Yeah, and of Omar as well because we tortured the wizards to try to get information out of them. Yeah, Ariana and then did. The wizards are, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm, and then there's the wizards torturing Omar in the very first Crota Fire Team. So now we have an image of Eris Morn being tortured. It's Fun. such, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Out of that needle, as if dispatched into the world through a fatal injection, comes the emancipated uh, magnificence of Dueling Karu. It's it's such a creepy, creepy card. But this is one of the options to end that last card because it says go to X, right? Yes, that's mm-hmm. that's card, if X. you score if you have a score of a hundred, go to X, which. Again, mm-hmm. the only option to get points within that previous entry was playing soccer with Eris. 
So that's that's where I I personally saw the connection there was, or I saw a possible connection. I guess I would should say between you mm-hmm. know the hundred points being with soccer games playing multiple soccer games with Eris. Well, you you play you enjoy Eris's presence so much. Here's a scene with Eris. Is kind of how I kind of took that. Yep. I have no idea if that's what I the intent agree. was, but that's, you know, to me, to my brain, that's what made sense. Um, chat. <laughs> what? <laughs> the hive don't know safe words. <laughs> it's so bad. Um, uh, there is another connection here as well to the uh, the witch. Um, yes. So we have. Witch as Savathun. Well, as Duel. Um, as Duel? Yeah, because... Or as because, Zavathun, because there's mention of the witch being Zavathun later. Correct, but there's also... Duel has the Ahamkara Bone ch- uh, China set, and also a, uh, also arrives through a needle that is... Hey, that's a callback to last week's episode on Dust. Right, yes. Sorry, yeah, that's the witch, right? Is Dust? Mm-hmm. Isn't that... Or mm-hmm. God, I always blend... Mm-hmm. I always it's the, confuse that with Ecdysis. I flip those all the time we haven't done ecdysis yet um so yeah the the connection there's a couple possible connections to dust in the sense that we have the needle uh being a means of transport as well as again a bone china set that is an ahamkara bone china set which that you know Mm -hmm. that's not also super creepy it's like here, have. Some- Please stop making my brethren into daily household items. Well, I was, I wasn't, I wasn't even, I wasn't even gonna go there, but I was gonna actually go <laughs> with the whole idea of like, hey, here's some green tea with a side of hallucinations. Yeah, I mean that sounds about right when you're hanging around coal. Yeah, that's about right. Okay, fair enough. I do love my tea. I, I don't I don't have a redeeming connection there <laughs> at all. <laughs> um, <laughs> The only other thing I noted on this one was that it is kind of a vision of Dul and Kara coming forward to divulge information pertaining to the purpose of the Dreaming City's curse and her role within it. Um, And I think that is especially true with the beginning of the presentation. And so X, the the step X is actually, I would argue, a multi-entry step. Um, because we get here a, an arguably new version of the books of sorrow. Um, and this is connecting back to the gift mass, which is, uh, I believe it's 46, yeah, 46, uh, card 46 from the books of sorrow from way back in destiny one, uh, which is where we see Savathun depart. Um, now the, the books of sorrow, the Books of Sorrow are told from Oryx's point of view. So we, we've we always known that that was a biased presentation. Uh, we even had Savathun graffiti, the book is full of lies, in it. So this is actually mm-hmm. referred to as verse 154I3, uh, which is her new compact. And so we actually see that particular portion of it from Sa- from arguably Savathun's point of view. Uh, and this is where you kind of start getting a concept that Savathun was also maybe involved with the creation of the Awoken, uh, with the entire concept of her playing with different modes of gathering tribute from around black holes and singularities, uh, which, again, connections here being Imbaru, being the nod of Kalia and the Safit, uh, you know, there's there's a lot of implications that could be drawn from the multiple comments that are that have been made here. Um, so yeah, so that's that's pretty much my uh, I, I yeah that's pretty much was the takeaway for me here. Um, Imbaru isn't mentioned here just yet, but it's being led up to. I think thank you is actually where. Yeah, thank you is where Imbaru is introduced. And so I think thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, Injection, I believe, so step X, I think, is actually a combination of injection and thank you. Um, Mm -hmm. I don't, I can't remember if it flows into you must as well. Yeah, I think it does flow into you must. But, But anyways, so X is, X is definitely like the meat of this particular entry of this book is that step X 
is a particularly important piece and it has a lot to unpack, but I don't know. Was there anything else in injection that you guys wanted to, to jump on? I mean, it's the idea that it, this, remember this is still part of the hallucination. Correct. Thing, correct. But, uh, it, uh, beyond that, it's the injection of Duel and Karu into Dreaming City. It's also the injection of Duel and Karu into so, you. Yes. Also, there's a mention of Ayat at the end. Mm-hmm. Yeah, from Savathun. Mm-hmm. Um, yep, yep, yep. So, yeah, do you want to jump to thank you? I think we should. I yes. think we should indeed. Uh, I got nothing on this card. Oh, really? I love <laughs> this card. Yeah. I, I I think that the thrall, I love the random thrall that Savathun's like, come here real quick. I'm going to talk at you. I want you to not understand anything that I'm saying to give me power. Because that is, in a nutshell, the entire point of Imbaru. Um, which I just, I I love the, the implications of Imbaru because we're seeing here a new variation of how to feed the worms. Which makes complete sense. Oryx had the navigation and the sword logic... Um, I'm sure that if they ever kind of fully dive into Zivu or Wrath, we're going to see, I'm, I'm hoping we'll see a new version of that as well, like Bloodsport or something like that. Um, and so Savathun is the, is the I, what was the title that we get with Savathun? Hang on real quick. <clears throat> Witch Queen Savathun, Archantrope, Queen of Encrypts, the Black Needle, Deepest in the High Coven, Emancipator of Worms, the Missing Piece of All Puzzles, who shall see the cosmos unborn into an infinite by dwindled egg. Game of Thrones has nothing on Savathun, is what I heard. Um, <laughs> no, so, but uh, I, I love the idea of like, Imbru is this concept of tribute of failing to understand. Um, and this is where we actually, I also argue that we see a really cool little funny nod at the lore community. Um, but really quick on Imbru, I wanted to say, where did I, where did I write this down? It's uh, Kin, Kinyarwanda, which is the language of Rwanda. Uh, it's the word for enchantment. Uh, so it's kind of a, Nice little nod to that as well as an enchantment. Um, Imbru is described here to a thrall, which I, again, I love. From a random crypt, Savathun selected a young thrall and summoned it to the High Coven. Um, and she basically did the super evil villain, I'm going to reveal my plot to you kind of thing. Uh, and thrall is just <laughs> the, the thrall is like completely confused. It's like, I, I don't, I don't, I don't know what's going on. Um, and she says with this, so she can, she's talking about all the failed uh, attempts to kind of trick the worms into letting her manipulate uh, pocket worlds and dip black holes to increase uh, the, the concept of, or to increase things to create basically a murder battery, which will give her infinite mm -hmm. power. Uh, the worms see through it and they, they kind of, they nip it in the bud really. And so she's like, okay. So she then goes back and says, all right, I'm going to refinance my entire existence. I'm going to create a, what she calls a humdinger of a scheme. I just I think that's funny. Um, she says, I'm going to move from an existential economy based on the accumulation of violence to an existential economy based on the accumulation of secrets and the tribute of failing to understand me. I shall name this tribute of failing to understand me in Baru, for it shall be as formless as the mist. Best part here is the thrall held up its claws as if to say, please slow down. <laughs> <laughs> Just whoa. Just whoa. Whoa, whoa, whoa. whoa. I, just, I can just see a thrall being like, I don't even know why I'm here, lady. Like, what is going on? <laughs> um, mm -hmm. uh, and so she kind of, she continues. She says, in the beginning, you all said to me, Savathun, you may never abandon cunning. If you do, your worm shall devour you. Cunning is the use of thought to predict the function of a system. Therefore, whatever a beating being should attempt to understand me and fail, has my cunning not defeated theirs? Wherever a falsehood is repeated about me, have I not displayed cunning? I shall gather tribute from every false prediction, misguided theory, fearful rumor, and ominous supposition which derives from the thought of me. 
and in time I shall pin my quiddity upon these rumors. I shall discorporate, so that I exist wherever my schemes and conspiracies also exist, and so I will be immortal as long as anyone seeks to understand me and fails. <laughs> Again, Thrall. She asked the Thrall, do you understand? Do you see? And the Thrall demurred, saying that it did not know much of metaphysics. <laughs> right. <laughs> I just love the thralls partake in this one. Um, so basically what what is being presented here is a reimagining of the source of the locus of power, right? Or the locus of power for Savathun's worm. Um, where Oryx focuses on the sword logic, the, the actual violence. Savathun is focusing on this concept of failing to understand. Because she is defining herself, she is defining her reality as a one of cunning or as what she says the existence of uh, secrets which i love because again this is a alternate form of gaining sustenance for her worm it's, it's a it's a different flavor even of sword logic arguably um uh, yeah, and then there's a few other points I had on the encrypted verse, but I didn't know if you guys wanted to... Did I miss anything for that first part? The encrypted verse is interesting because essentially in this one they call out that you're not going to break this code because they call us a one-time pad. Yes, yeah, which is... Oh my gosh, I love the who am I portion too. Mm-hmm. Which, granted, that who am I portion is really cool because it lists off so many stinking... Trickster uh, gods. Trickster mm -hmm. gods, which is cool because you have a Nasi and uh, Kagan and Coyote, which are really interesting gods. But <laughs> it also reads like an utter an utter um, code. I feel like there's it's, a code it's in a, there. It's an enigma. Of the tease of... I think it's, it's an right. enigma, but I think it's an unsolvable enigma. Because I think, and I don't, I'm not saying because it's so difficult, I think it's purposely unsolvable because there is no solution. Yes. It's, it's written cryptically as in order to be just written cryptically. Uh, again, Which going back to we in know Baru. Seth likes to do yes, that. yes, and and mm -hmm. I using using a little bit of fourth wall breaking there. Also, given who who we know wrote this, yes, that is also true. But um, but going back in in game too, you see that within the concept of Imbaru, because again, remember this is what Savathun's ultimate goal is: is to become this this mist of uh, of lo I mean, I I would argue a, a logical enigma or a logical mystery really uh, mm -hmm. is is her form of immortality, whereas Oryx's form of immortality was being survived by whatever ultimately killed him through violence, Savathun's will be whatever defeats her on a intellectual level. If if she can but as long as she has a rumor about her, she will always be alive. It's it's a Right. Again, it's a brilliant display of the same concept that we saw with Oryx. Oryx is talking about the literal experience of defeating defeating him on a military or a militant level, and Savathun is mm -hmm. talking about the actual existence of memory. Um, and and arguably that is going to be the true immortal, the true form of immortality is through one's memories. I, I just I really like that that particular metaphysical um, interpretation of immortality. Uh, but yes, I also love the the like a few of the descriptions in the encrypted verse. <laughs> the the uh, the one that it really fun one is uh, the pow purposeful mob, none whose members know its purpose. <laughs> Mm -hmm. which is that a is that a wall breaking towards us no i think i just i think that's just a, I, I mean it's just another one of like mantis serpent kane uh, a nazi siri cleans his brother's stomach you know the grandmaster like all these different kind of nods to different little myths and legends and you know infinite regress of enigmas the self-questioning answer um you know it, it's just again i i think it's just one of those things where it's like mob mentality it's it's a very common uh sociological concept that 
mob mentality. You, you get a mob together, you can get them to do almost anything, and they're very purposeful in doing them, but they're not going to ever, you know, the more people you add into a group, the arguably as a, as a whole, the lower the IQ. Um, that's, that's the concept of mob mentality. And that's exactly what this is, is a, the, the purposeful, the purposeful crowd of mob or the purposeful mob that doesn't think like, as long as you, as long as you just keep doing what she wants you to do, you will give her immortality in a way that is just general guardians. I mean, I guess you could argue, but I also would say that's not restricted to just guardians. That's just everyday people as well. <laughs> Sabathun's defeated by Reddit. <laughs> oh, God. Everybody's defeated so by Reddit. Thing... Reddit is the true boss of oh, everything. Yeah. Anyways, um, I do, I do also mm-hmm. want to call out that the ending of this particular entry I really like. <clears throat> she says, here at the center, I lie to you the truth. You have everything you need to know it, but I will give you a clue as the duelist gives warning before she draws. The answer you seek to the Dreaming City is simple, not complex. Thank you, sweet friend. You are a gift and a delight. You are more dear than my mother, for you have given birth to me a thousand times. Yeah. So Cole had a good interpretation of this earlier, and it totally threw me for a loop because I had not thought of it. Cole, you wanna you wanna share that one because that was insightful. I forget now. I don't think that's it, in my notes. <laughs> it was the it was the interpretation of the word lie. Oh yeah. So instead of actually like lying, as in I'm lying to you that I put salt in your coffee instead of sugar, it's more like lying things on the table as if showing your hand. That sort of thing. Like lying the tablecloth on the table, that sort of thing. So it's like, mm-hmm. it's two different, because we have the lie to the anti entire cards, and then lying everything on the table, that's again a diet of two different parts coming together. So it could be a total different definition. <clears throat> yeah, it's a play on Man, excuse me. It's a play on the word. Yep. Yeah, because that would be... Huh. Yeah. I mean... <laughs> it totally changes the interpretation of it, doesn't it? Instead of lies I mean, I, as in uh, falsehoods. <laughs> here at the center, I lie to you the truth. I lay down the truth to you. Yeah, and I'm just... I'm My brain doesn't like the the... Mm-hmm. The symmetry of that sentence um, is where I'm kind of pause and where I'm pausing with that one. Um, I mean, it, it makes a, it does. There are double word. There's oh yeah, yeah, yeah. A lot of I mean, things in here for oh, sure. Yes, um, it doesn't. It doesn't change the way I'm reading it. I mean, like I, I, it changes the way I interpret that sentence. But my end conclusion is still going to say the same. That mm. the answer is simple, not complex. Because this is yes. dual, basically saying, you know, hey, look, she she is she so, is lying to us, but in her lying, she is leading us to the truth. Yes. And it, an interesting thing about talking about the center of things in the Dreaming City, the center is the confluence, right? Uh, yes. The blind yeah, well, yeah, yeah. The the, I, was gonna, I was I was thinking blind if, well, but yes, the confluence is right below. I think if I remember that correctly. Yes. Um, shoot. Um, Blue and I went in there earlier. Not Blue. Wicked and I went in there earlier and we're looking around. And if you are in the confluence, you do not show up anywhere on the map. Correct. It's but very if you go confusing. Into the zones out- <laughs> it is. But if you go out into the zones outside of there, you will. So you'll show up as a an arrow at the top of the map. So it's an interesting. Why would you disappear on the map? Not necessarily. They're saying that there's a lore reason or a real reason for I mean, it, but it's. I find it interesting because that that's also that a, that's also the borehole in the reality. Yeah. So you're kind of transcending both realities. You're neither you're neither in the ascendant nor in the. It's kind of like a. It's an elevator shaft, really, between the two. Is the way I always kind of took it. So you're you're in transit, basically, mm-hmm. uh, which to me would make that whole pro that whole idea a little bit more i don't I, i'm that's just my head canon so i have no abs- absolutely no backup to that claim but that's that's right. kind of where i've always kind of that's how i've always understood it um mm-hmm. 
I don't know if that answers that question though. I don't know if there's per like a real question to it, but there's definitely just it makes you makes you wonder a tiny bit. Not really a, a real theory of any sort, just a hmm, I wonder why they did this. Mm-hmm. But you must has the biggest number I've ever seen written down that is not literally a like ver- version of pi. A hundred Googles. Is that what yep, that is? That's what that is. It's ten hundred go or ten 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 go. I can't remember. Googles? No, it's because there's a ten at the beginning of it. No, no, no. If you if you include if you include the ten, that's a hundred. I want to say it's a hundred googles. I wrote that down. I have I have randomly on my notes with Truth to Power the word hundred googles. Okay. I am not going to claim that that is what that is reference to, but in my brain, I'm assuming that I saw this number and I went out and figured it out. Um, I don't know. If I'm wrong, just don't don't yell at me. I think that's a hundred Googles. Is what I'm saying. <laughs> There's just a lot of zeros. There's a lot of zeros, which makes me think that it's a Google. They should have done something to the something power instead. Yeah, but that's not as that's not as impressive <laughs> as two two yeah, solid lines of text. <laughs> that are zeros. Oh yeah. my god. I don't know. It's just one of those uh, so this is in One this is in the things. you must right is where we're we're talking about. So mm-hmm. this is also where we see dual having the uh, China set and the choices. There we're kind of returning into the choice of the hallucination. Uh, so this is again continuation of step X. Um, you're given a choice to drink from the dual or drink bleh, drink from the China set. Or, or tea set, sorry, the fine tea set of Ahamkara bone. Uh, you can choose mm-hmm. to drink or not. Uh, basically, it's a matrix moment. And really, honestly, it doesn't really give you the option to not. It's just to drink. Uh, so to drink the poison, continue reading. Taste of bitter regret and psychosis sweat. hey Um mm-hmm. Also, I like the idea, the fact here that it's presented as a poison to end the thoughts of human neo-human or machine so human awoken or exo so basically cole you don't get a you don't get a get out of jail free card on this one um dang it i was hoping (laughs) uh again this is gonna kind of nod into the book of dust because you see a cosmos before you like a spider web of light filament of galactic supercluster shine in the clouds of invisible dark matter which glue their mass together Dark energy yawns in the space between all things ever growing, ever spreading, uh, which is, you know, a, a, a nod towards dust and the presentation of the nine as the dark, um, dark matter spider webs that are connecting kind of everything. Um, and then this kind of goes back into uh, the concept of the 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 devouring black hole. Um, and this is where you start getting presented with the idea of, you know, Cole, again, going back to Cole's concept of the C3I as subversive. This is where you start seeing the kind of twisting of that screw. Because at the end here, it's cl- it's presented to you as you are a guardian. You must protect life. And then immediately after it, it's if all life is information and guardians strive to preserve life and information is preserved when it is secret, then you must convert all life to the most secure form of secrets durable to the end of time. You must cast all the life you cherish into a black hole. It's like the most cyclical logic I've ever seen. Well, actually, it's not, but it's it's a it's a form of circular logic Um, and it's innately false in itself uh because it's basically saying in order to protect life you must destroy it and because the definition that they are ascribing to what is life is information and information will be retained by the master record of all that has been beaten which is mentioned above it says life arises life spreads contests itself and changes so again sore logic Great things are built and destroyed, but from your vantage point, you see that the victor of each struggle contains in its negative in the marks left upon it by a loser in the shapes it assumed to win, again, sword logic, the master record of all that it has beaten. Information may not be erased. Whatsoever survives until the end of the cosmos will possess and remember all which came before it. There's another word for that. It's the final shape. 
So again, we see Savathun with the concept of Imbaru and Dulankaru with the concept of Imbaru. Same concept, different flavor of the ob- the option to achieve the final shape. That final shape is to be that master record at the end of all time. And so in order to do that, they are subverting the Guardian's definition of life to create a a cyclical destruction machine, uh, another infinite battery, if you will. Um, and that's really, again, kind of it's it's we're seeing the culmination of the subversive tactics that have been going on through this entire book. And it's basically it's all been to kind of seed that doubt, seed that that discomfort of what we know to be reality. Again, remember hallucinations, paranoia. It's very in line with what's being done to our guardian within these entries. Uh, we see this mentioned in stolen intelligence about the waking hallucination that our guardians experience as being reported to the hidden. And as a point of concern about that particular point, because hallucinations cause paranoia, that that's a very common, you know, it's not necessarily caused. It's not exactly causal, but there are high correlations there. Uh, and again, this is where that ca- that cause of concern comes from is this particular ending of this entry. And yeah, black flag in chat. It's it's a it's an attempt to pervert our heroic nature so that we will become the charge for her murder battery. I cannot put that in a better way. That is extremely accurate. It's a it's an attempt to pervert the noble nature of our guardian into becoming an a champion of darkness instead of a champion of light by tricking us into thinking that by what we do by justifying it by the ends. This is the this is the ultimate argument that the ends justify the means. But I don't know if you guys if you guys have anything you want to weigh in on that one. The not really. I mean it's just all the mentions of black holes in the last and throughout this book, especially mm. Mm. Yeah, no. I'm all right, good. so let's yeah, no, let's nothing. choose to react. <laughs> Another creepy. <laughs> so this is the other. Creepy I mentioned card. the bookends. I think this is my argument would be that this is kind of the the end part of it. So this is the ending of our waking hallucination. Yes. So it it basically ends up with us dying at the end, essentially by jumping off the tower. Uh, z- so this one, unlike the first one, this one actually does have mul- uh, different endings. One, Multiple one endings, which is yeah. actually the ending, which is step Z, uh, which is the ending of the hallucination. But there are other, uh, I guess technically they all do lead to the Z ultimately. Um, mm-hmm. They do. It's... Where you jump off mm-hmm. the tower. And you get the Atheon mask. What? Yes. <laughs> yes, for pushing pushing somebody off the tower right no you got the atheon mask was from jump like literally just jumping off the tower oh right from the yeah halloween from the halloween event. yeah i love that that was a huge nod to cheesing atheon because baby baby mm-hmm. bumpers were not always a thing guardians baby bumpers were not always a thing nope not at all oh um i'm trying to think here really other than just being a ending point uh that's really it to hear you leap you leap from the tower and escape Coria's simulation um uh and then we get to a pseudum a pseudum which is medusa backwards and i love the nod the nod yes. at the very beginning you must be terribly confused yes yes i am yes that is that is that, that is, is an accurate, accurate is statement i'm pretty morning. sure that's the only fully accurate thing that i feel comfortable saying accurate fact is I am very confused. <laughs> um, but again, this, so this is, again, this is reverting back to the presentation that this is Medusa, um, you know, kind of a an attempt to explain from the perception of Medusa uh, what is going on. Um this is where we get nod, or nods to earlier entries about how they were misinformation by Coria. Uh, namely, the the number point number four is you must continue to hold the Dreaming City as long as you can. The things I said to you about black holes and the purpose of guardians were forced on me by Coria. Um, 
so again, mixed messages here uh, with the fact that Medusa has suppo- supposedly Medusa has said, you know, this is the point of the Guardians is, you know, defend the city, you know, bring all the Guardians you can here, throw life into black holes because that's the ultimate protection. She's now saying, no, that wasn't me. That was, well, it was me, but it was, you know, it was in, it was forced upon by Coria as a AI. Coria would be able to interface with her, uh, you know, because the Vex technological superiority there. Um, we also do get a really kind of nice little explanation of the shibboleth used by the Ahamkara uh, with the the verb, the vernacular uh, trap, uh, and also a little bit of a nod as to the explanation and conflict between the worm gods and the Ahamkara, the hive worm parasites. Um, and that's in point number three. I do kind of like that. I don't, I mean, again, you know, like chat saying right now too, it's an, or Dino in chat saying, you know, it's, it's tough. We don't, we don't know how much of this is true. We don't know how much of this is false, uh, within game. Uh, so like there's, there's an, there's a legit entire possibility that all of this is just made up, but there's also an entire legit person possibility that some of this is actually true. Um, we know that some of it is arguably accurate, uh, cause there's, you know, again, degrees, uh, which this could be, um, point of view. It's just because your point of view is different. Doesn't necessarily mean you're lying. Um, so, I mean, that, that to me is a nod to, that doesn't necessarily negate everything. Uh, cause I can see the potential for bias, if you will, as being logically present, but I don't know if you guys have anything else within this particular one that you wanted to talk about. Uh, Duel and Karu. Everything going on in this one. This book is a mirror. Mm-hmm. A, and a so, dark mirror? Well, maybe. It's just a mirror in general. It's it's the... We're returning back to the beginning. We had Eris. We had Medusa. We had Zabathun. And now we're going back to Medusa. And then will end up with It's Just Me and Eris again. Mm-hmm. It is a... It's not perfectly folded in half. Uh, yeah. But there are 11 cards. It's pretty close, yeah. Which... It's pretty damn close. And I think that's means... also nice, too, because within the... Uh, what is it? Act, choose, react. We also see this the cycle is very prevalent, which makes sense given that's the Dreaming City, right? Mm-hmm. 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 And you're dealing with Duel and Karu and Kuria and everything. Um, I'm trying to think, you know, again, I have I have an alternate take on the uh, the hallucinations, too, that I want to talk about after we get done with uh, It's Just Me. That I Let's do the It's Just Me, okay. then. So, He's finished it so like Green, you were saying, this is the, the brain in full circle Return. of what is going on here do you want to give us a summary of it i'm so ashamed mid-sentence mid-thought it's basically the admission of feeling guilty over the whole thing and eris basically saying hey yeah this really was me i made everything up i'm sorry i'm ashamed it sucks but but it's just that it's there's not much else to it what a fool i've been it was pitiful weakness loneliness you know that kind of thing but beyond that the fact that she says i ought at the very end it's just throws everything back out of whack <laughs> though the explanation of why she says i ought at the end also can be used right, to defend which it which is nice because she says do you yeah do you know what the hives say when they want to express the inevitability of a thing, when they want to say it is this way because it could be no other way, Ayat. And thus ends that book, which is full of lies and full of things and full of confusion. Yes. Yes, it is. You must be dreadfully confused. Do you want to point out that, uh... Yeah, go ahead. Uh, Ayat actually is Latin as well for third person singular. Mm-hmm. So... Mm-hmm. That's a fun little tidbit. Though I think, if I remember correctly, that was not the intentional use of it. 
because I know that it's the Latin term because it was it third person. Is it the uh, I, super super? super bleh, 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 bleh. I don't even know. I don't know L- grammar. Superative. That one. Um, but I remember because uh, Seth actually gave a definition of Ayat that he was using for the Book of Sorrows as well. And I don't think it was the... I, I think he might have used the, the term, but I don't think he's using the definition, if I remember that correctly. I'm not sure if I'm remembering that correctly, though. I don't remember what Seth said, but should we start wrapping up a little bit? Yeah. Uh, so what actually, before we do, I wanted to also make the comment about the saltine taste. Um, we do, and Green, I completely forgot. I had mentioned this to you, but I completely forgot to bring this up. Um, we do have mm-hmm. another substance that causes hallucination and taste of salt that is specific to the Destiny universe, and that is the Vex milk. Um, yes. So with the and and the reason that that is relevant for this particular entry or these entries is that again this this argument that Coria is the one that is causing these hallucinations. It would make sense, and we have we do have previous experience with a guardian who imbibed Vex uh, milk and transcended things, and that would be Kabir. Um, you know, and and we see that there's there's dangerous implications if that is what's going on, because with Kabir we also see a nod of the comment: "If you encounter me again, I will no longer be who I am now." Uh, so there's, there's that, you know, that factoid hanging over our mouth or over our minds. Um, but I did want to make a comment that that could also be a possible explanation of what is causing hallucinations and leaves the taste of salt is the, the use of Vex milk. Yes. Thank you, Dino. Uh, this is it. Or, so this is the definition of Ayat is this is it. And it's person purpose is expression. It's meaning is the invocation of what it is. The mission is to draw the mind and make an incision of curiosity and be that incision, which is a question and its own solution to make one hunger for an answer whose answer is its own wanting. Ayat. This is it. It is that utterance is the definition mm-hmm. um, from uh, bop, 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 Seth. Uh, and yeah, trigger actually, that's kind of where I'm my kind of one of my last spin foil Worries. spin foil theories is, is that this is not actually anyone that we've encountered before, but this could actually be Kabir reemerging. Oh, whoa. That's a weird hat. <laughs> we have nods that Kabir has not been completely destroyed. We just know that Kabir right, is no longer a guardian. It's. And How would Kabir get into the Queen's throne room slash Coria. To leave messes? But why would Kabir be working with Coria? Because Kabir is no longer Kabir. Kabir is part of the Vex network. Because when he ingested but the a- when he ingested the milk to create the Aegis, um, he he. I mean, and the reason the reason why this this weird spin foil theory exists in my head is because it. It mm-hmm. neatly explains the inside information that this character that is writing this has about guardians, uh, the familiarity of ghosts, the familiarity of what it is that guardians make as far as heroic things. Kabir was known as the Legionless. He was a renowned hero. He was, you know, known for his courage. Um, he was known for his heroic qualities, uh, similar to. And again, I'm just, you know, this is me just kind of spitballing, but it's like, you know, again, we, this is not the first time that we've seen a, a massive hero suddenly become a villain. Rezel mm-hmm. was exactly the same. Well, no, no. Rezel was not exactly the same as could be. As far as an arc, it could be. You could argue that it was. But the Vex have no sort of path of sorrow. No, but they have, they have the ability to corrupt. It's just a different form. Asher's been touched by And you could argue that Asher is corrupted. Asher himself comments that he could be corrupted. But Asher still functions with the amount of free will that we suspect he still has. Well, and there's a lot to unpack in that comment. But the the other point within that is that Asher has only had a physical component of himself replaced. He did not actually fully imbibe and channel his light away to create a weapon of power 
you know, Kabir, again, we have a specific call out by Kabir that in order to create the Aegis inside the Vault of Glass, he gave up what it was to be a guardian. Um, he- Trigger clarification on that. We don't know if that was actually the captain or if that was a Vex who had assimilated the ish personality and memories of the captain. Which part? Failsafe's former captain becoming a harpy. Oh, yeah, well, uh, Failsafe even admits that it's probably not. Yeah. Um, but yeah, correct. Though, again, you know, again, that kind of goes back into the argument. I mean, this is, and this is, this is a potential massive tangent as far as like the concept of what memory is, as far as is it able to be ingrammatically contained uh, with the existence of exos that creates a very dangerous path in which that argument has a lot of uh, validity. Um, you know, it would not be the first time that you could argue that a individual is digitized, if you will, into a machine form. Uh, and again, there's there's lots of problems with that tra- that definition or that con- conclusion with the exos being present. Because if you can digitize a human into an exo body, what prevents the Vex from digitizing? Or if is the Vex how we learned how to digitize? You know, there's there's a couple rabbit holes that go down that particular path as well. But yeah, no, I mean, I do, I I will be honest, I do have a a slight theory that this whole thing is potentially going to lead to an introduction to Kabir, um, which I find, which I would find just. I would love, but I mean, again, that's just a theory that I have. Um, there's, there's no, the no grounds lovely, about that. About, the lovely thing about that, it provides a whole slew of characters. Yeah. And, and the reason because the other, sorry, yeah. the other reason is because we've also seen recently a resurgence of Kabir focused items. Uh, we have Kabir's glass Agus, for instance, which has mm-hmm. just recently gotten a lot of attention uh, from people and i mean it, it's just i mean and to me it's it could be coincidence you know there's a lot of people going that there's a lot of people that work on components within the story there's a lot of different storylines going on but you know right. again point of theory being you know having fun and doing crazy theories i just i would love to actually have another page or chapter in the story of Kabir and I think this would be a really cool way to dovetail it back in mm. so the whole point of this book is it is a a um it's a virus it's a way to get into our information it's an system. earworm it, it's it's more well, no that. but I mean as a concept of like it's a Trojan right horse. right it's it's a it's so a, a, a parallel would be the same way that a weapon of sorrow is from Oryx's brood as a means to Trojan horse and violence. This is particularly a thought puzzle weapon of sorrow. You know, this is this is an enigma that is designed to infiltrate and uh, make up ups, people obsess over. And that goes back to that concept of Imbaru, right? You know, this idea of achieving immortality through creating an obsessed obsession of trying to decipher the undecipherable so that actually segues into my theory about this whole book oh do tell yes i'm excited the the thing i've been hinting to this entire freaking time um so going all the way back to the beginning we already see a quote-unquote code break and it goes from character to character to character and we've been sitting here for what three and a half hours going over theories of what this could possibly mean here, what it could possibly mean there. It gives you the whole choose your own adventure thing, which eventually feeds into another thing, and then it goes back to choose your own adventure, and then it goes stair steps back up the characters. I don't think it's Dolankaru, Eris, Sabathun, the Vex. I don't think any of them wrote this for one specific, well, not one specific reason. But for various reasons. So it's none of the characters we know like we do. Because we can sit here and talk about any of these characters all night long. But it's one name we always overlook because it's like, oh, they got me again. I think it's the architects. It's a a fourth wall break. It's a fourth wall break. It's this whole book is a test to see how we as not only players but as because as we think as our guardians 
what we would do with this whole book. And as we're doing now, right now is in borrow. Right, no, yeah, we're talking right, about right. it. We're going to talk about it forever. So I think it's literally the architects going from the real world into this world and giving us this book that none of us understand. And it even makes a connection back to Marathon, as we saw, which again, was Bungie. So I think this whole thing is just Bungie screwing with us, not only as Guardians, because that's how we're deciphering it, but as players, because this book is driving us crazy. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> and I I acknowledge that my my one my yeah. one problem with that is that from within like story like just analysis and stuff like that fourth wall breaks are really problematic because and and they're all slippery slopes right you know like as soon as you have one it starts you have the deus ex machia uh, potential and I'm not gonna say. I'm not going to say I disagree because I totally do see the point there. Um, but I guess I I would say I hope it's not a fourth wall break because... I mean, we already had it with the nine. But did we? With the emissary. Yes, I think we did. Did we? I, I would argue that there's, there's a way to present that, that that's not a fourth wall break. I mean... Considering the verbiage and everything that is there, I think it was... It could be now. Not as it could be. It could be fourth wall. It break. could be taken as a fourth wall break. I totally agree that that could be like there's there's you know there's obviously different ways you can interpret things um, as as we've discussed with this like you know the the words used doesn't yay to English language, um, you know there's multiple meanings behind things. But I honestly I'm hard pressed to think of anything that it's like the concept of retcons, right? Um, if you look at it one way, yes, it's a retcon. But if you look at it another way, it's not necessarily a retcon. It's just a clarification, uh, which is a admittedly a form of retcon, but it is not the negative form of retcon that everyone uses as a as a bait switch word. Um, I, I would say that the instance for the fourth wall break within the emissary, um, I understand a lot of people's interpretation of that as a fourth wall break. I disagree with it uh, because there is also an equally valid interpretation of keeping that within the universe of destiny and um, maintaining that. Uh, so I, I, I mean, again, just I, I really don't like when fourth wall breaks happen as, as humorous as they do tend to be. Um, well, I don't think it's humorous. I think this is it, the fourth wall break is actually an intentional end game mechanic when destiny is done and at its 10 year cycle. Yeah. I mean, again, I, I, this is me just personally. Um, I see it. I just hope it's not because I don't know that to me, to me that destroys the, the escapism of what it is to be a video game, to be blunt. Not really. It actually, it, it pushes the escapism into reality because when you think about it, and this goes back to, you know, let's talk about the character thing, the, the last episode I was on. So we can sit here and we talk about it as characters. We go and we play as our characters and we have all these subtle little fourth wall breaks. And even right now, we're sitting here and we're talking it as if we're in the game, we're living this. And that's now that world, the Destiny world leaking back. And when we take our character from game to game to game, and we keep playing and we keep getting more submerged into it and just living this life of, like, even I did it. I did it tonight. You know, I'm an exo. Now, really, I'm human. Obviously, I'm sitting here and it's hot as heck in my apartment because I live in Texas, but I still think of myself as if I lived in this world, I'd be an exo. Now we go through the entire game series, going through these things, going through these alien universes, these experiences, all that, and we wrap our minds around it, which, like the lore, it's all subjective to interpretation, just like real life mm-hmm. is. And then we come to the final end of Destiny where, you know, Bungie says, this is it. This is the last cutscene you're ever going to see. We're done. And before, like, you, even before the credits roll, it doesn't really matter. But that last cutscene that comes up isn't actually a rendered cutscene, but it's some darkened figure sitting in a room full of servers, because as we've seen, so many servers in the game, 
something similar to that, and the person says, thank you for playing the game, all of your data, your favorite weapons, race, origin, so on and so forth, has been saved, your ghost will be waiting for you on the other side. You cannot tell me that wouldn't be so freaking cool at the end of Destiny. The whole thing being a test. I mean, <laughs> I'm going to have to agree to disagree with you. Um, I think it'd be I, amazing. I get it. now escapism leaking into this I, world. I get it. And I, I like I said, I, I completely see that presentation. I do. I, I completely see it as a potential thing. Um, to me, just personally... I view that as a huge cop out um, from a storytelling perspective. Uh, I just that's just my personal just my personal opinion. Um, I'm not a fan of those particular things because the entire point of me playing a video game is to not connect with real world. Uh, that's just again personal personal choice. There, I choose to play RPGs and and you know the video games that I play because they offer me an alternative to reality. Um, I make choices in game that if I were presented with a choice in real life, I would vastly choose differently. Um, That to me is the entire crux and point of escapism. And that is what allows me also a heightened immersion with my characters within a virtual reality environment. Um, But again, like I said, I see what you're saying and I completely I mean I that's if that's the ultimate goal then sure I, I, I guess that's that is what it is um, but to me that would be that would leave a hollow feeling in me if that was actually the end because it's like no that's not I mean to me to me that's just not an end that's just basically laziness as far as I'm concerned. To me, that that blurs the line really well, because if they actually have that cutscene of, you know, your ghost is waiting for you on the other side, I'd be looking at the 13 ghosts I have on my desk going, just looking at them right now, there's literally 13 ghosts on my desk. And I say, okay, which one of you is it? Right. No, and like like I said, (laughs) like I said, I get it. I get that. Because I've I've heard that, I've heard that particular idea multiple times. And I, I mean, and to be blunt, it's also not just Destiny. There's a lot of... A lot of RPGs, a lot of MMOs that have that same argument too. Um, I don't know. I, I just, to me personally, I like I like having a compartmentalization present. Uh, just just personally. So I mean, again, that entire opinion. That's not anything factual or or subjective analysis of anything like right there. But yeah, trigger trigger in chat is like to I I I would struggle to see that as a true ending, um, but that's just my interpretation of the story. I mean, yeah, I can see it from your perspective. Like it would like there's no finality to it at all, and it you know I can see it being hollow for some people. I just for me that would be actually really cool to see is just the blurring mm-hmm. of the lines because the whole thing is called destiny, and we're making our legend to the entire game. So. Right, and I guess at the That's end of the day, though. too, it, it would also, it also, I, I will, I will end my counter, my never-ending counter argument to this point. Um, I will end it with it. Also depends on if that was the intent all along. I would probably be a little bit more okay with it, because a lot of times, oh, yeah. a lot of times when you see that particular conclusion to a story of any kind, it's. It, it really is just nine times out of ten. It's like, I don't know how to end this, so I'm going to wrap it up. And this yeah. is an easy do sex machia. Oh, it's all it's all hallucination anyways. I'm like, I'm like, well, that's <laughs> because, I mean, to me, what that tells me is that it doesn't matter. Like, you know, and, and whereas you're yeah. saying, whereas, whereas you're interpreting is like, it does matter. To me, it's like that that invalidates everything. It's like I, I interpreted things specifically based off the understanding that this this world existed in an, in a cosmos within itself and to end it like that would invalidate all those logical, those conclusions in a way. I don't know if that makes sense. I can see that. No, it makes sense. That's, that makes definitely makes sense. Definitely two different perspectives. Oh yeah. It. Yeah. Oh, yeah. In, in true. Yeah. It's no different than it being, you know, like it would be no different than it ending and being like, Oh, Hey, you were captured by the Vex. Nothing happened in the past seven years. I'm like, God, I just, I would <laughs> probably have to walk away for at least a couple weeks because I'd be like, really, really, 
<laughs> so green, stop <laughs> us. <laughs> yeah, green. Save us. Because uh-huh. this is a never-ending argument. Uh, yeah, I know. It's a forever arguing battery in a Taurus. <laughs> murder, murder argument. I'm going to murder some people for the murder argument. I, I, mm, sorry, this book just makes me tired. Makes my head hurt. <laughs> makes my brain tired. Trust me, I've had a migraine this entire time. So all, all I yeah. all I hear is lore writers going mission accomplished. Yeah, basically, that's yeah. that's ultimately. I mean, Cole's Cole's idea about the architects or the fourth wall break. In all reality, even if it's not written from the perspective of the architects, it is the writers in some ways being like, I'm going to put in the most difficult, convoluted, <laughs> just mm-hmm. absolute, and forgive me for saying this, bleep me out, bull <laughs> in a freaking book that's just going to make every lore person who has any inkling of what's going on just scratch their heads because and that's why i love it i feel like i i love it but i hate it and that's what i told cole earlier today it's like i love this book but i really really hate this book <laughs> because i i just love how you two are sit, sitting over there like tearing out your hair going what does it mean what does it mean oh yeah. you're like oh oh that's cool all right I'm Let's really, go kill some stuff. I'm just, I've been murdering people in Crucible, taking out my frustrations there. So it's... And I, I think that's that's also mess. the beauty of the writing, too, right? Is that it, it, right. it encapsulates like it. the entire right. frustration because it's purposely written to be unsolvable. Right. It is written to... And they say you you are the... What is it? The one... The one notepad or the one, one time, yeah, the one time password that by the time, time you pad. figure it out, it will go back in time and rewrite it so that you can't figure it out based on what you figured it out with. Right. It's a never ending cycle. I lo- mm-hmm. I just, I love it. I love that entire concept because I also really like Doctor Who. So, you know, it makes sense that mm-hmm. I would like something as timey wimey as this. Right. It's just, it's a beautiful frustration. And it's, I think it's the biggest frustration that we've had in D2 since some of the stuff in D1. Like, we used to get this mad at stuff in D1. Yeah, and that... Yeah, I can... I mean, there's there's some things... haven't had that in There's a some long things time. that I get that... Right. I mean, like, Enchilada, for instance. I'm kind of wanting to know more about that. <laughs> but, um... I don't even know it, what it what is the actual word, because I'm sure people are confused. Enchiladas? That one. Uh, it's Enchilada. Um... um. It's the same reason I call Pahanin pancake. It's just because I get tired of mispronouncing the mm-hmm. thing, and it's like, whatever. You know what I mean. Except people mm-hmm. who don't know what I mean are probably endlessly confused why I'm talking about Tex-Mex food. Um, right. But enchiladas are good, actually. But anyways. No. Um, but no, I mean, like I think that's where I kind of, like I said, I had to read it numerous times before I started really kind of appreciating that it's like, okay, no, I'm not just... I'm not just missing something. I think that's actually the point is to to create that that endless quest for understanding that is the human condition that is tying in here and that is that's the thing that really hooks you on this and I I I love it because it just captures that so well without saying it. Mm-hmm. It's just it's masterfully done and I really really think i can't say that enough i think that this shows what it is that is what it is that causes obsession is what's shown in this book because as much as you moan and groan and as much people complain about how this book is not making sense and blah 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 they're still talking about it they're still trying to figure like it's it's a human thing to try to make stuff fit into some some form of logic and when you can't it actually becomes that thorn in your side. It becomes that that you know earworm in your head that you just can't let go of. I like it. But yes, uh, I also just I want to know. I know the point of the book is a Trojan horse, essentially, into our own information system. But I want to know why. That is the thing that drives me crazy more than anything else in this book. Is like why, 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 why writers, why. But that is why. Mm-hmm. See, and I, I guess that's the thing is like I, I'm also coming at it from the recent conversation we had with John, uh, where he like 
he admitted that a lot of some of the things that he's written is not actually to necessarily, I'm not going to say it's not to further things, but the point is to cause people to ask questions. They are, they are written specifically to cause this type of confusion, to cause this type of discourse, to cause this type of interaction. That is, that is something that writers of this medium, they try endlessly to do. And to see that done so well with this book, as frustrated as it may cause people to get, is also a nod to just how skilled this this particular writing team with Bungie, you know, Seth, uh, John, Mousy, uh, Jill, Jill was with them. Uh, you know, I mean, all of these all of these writers are really aware of what it is that as players we are we are looking for and they know how to pull on those those plot hooks they know how to pull on those heartstrings if you will to keep us coming back from a from a storytelling perspective or we can take it uh in in the way that veru is saying and savathun controls destiny writers that's your architects for you right there but anyways shout outs i don't know how else to segue out of this Green, save us. Again. Uh, shout outs. Shout outs are... T- uh, I have two shout outs. One is kind of more a personal shout out for my channel. Um, I am streaming on a more regular basis. So if you are on Twitch and have a bit of time and you see me pop up in the feed, hit me up at Green Eye Music Lover on Twitch, which would be awesome. Come hang out. Sometimes we talk lore, especially if you ask things in chat. Sometimes we uh, just hang around and argue, argue and shoot things <laughs> and talk about things that are probably not FFC safe sometimes. It's just, there's a whole slew of things. But that is one of them. The other one is a shout out to the upcoming event of Guardian Con and all of the charity streams that in, that are involved with that. If you are a supporter of um, children's health in general, uh, doesn't you don't have to do the Guardian Con per se uh, charity stream or anything like that. Just reach out, promote, do things to help further that cause because I think that cause is a very important one for the children's hospital and like that. So that's my, my shout out, shout outs, plural this time around, just help out where you can be there for other people and try to make each day a little bit better for somebody in the world. Sentimental, short and sweet. Cole, Cole. your turn. Shout out. Shout out to pancakes. Yeah. Pancake. (laughs) Oh wait, you're talking about the actual food. (laughs) I um, I get unnaturally excited with pan. Never mind. I'm not. I'm gonna cut that out of the episode. <laughs> nope, it's There's, staying. That's that's totally. Yeah, <laughs> there you go. No, but uh, I don't think I really have any shout outs other than you know, if you're going to Guardian Con, you can come yeah. see me at the booth called Bad Redacted Joke. It's no longer Bad Destiny Joke. What is up with it's the now- redacted title now? It's because so it's because she has five billion different accounts. I can't call it bad Destiny Anthem Halo Borderlands <laughs> joke. That is way too long. I mean, you could way too long. You can make an I you could. can make an acronym out of them. I could, but then Omni Waffle, who runs the <laughs> you know artist booth alley, is going to be all ticked off that the name is so long and doesn't fit on a banner. Mm-hmm. So uh, to just cover the entire branding, it's just bad redacted joke now. Plus, you know, I won't get sued for using a game name. So. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> That's always good. Yeah, I don't want to get sued. Bad, sci- bad sci-fi shooter <laughs> joke. Bad sci-fi good shooter job. joke? Yeah. <laughs> That's what yeah, Vero, all I got. That's Vero. Um, uh, shout out to Pins. Man. Right. Gifting, gifting subs at the beginning of the stream. That was, that was really extremely generous, Pins. I hope you don't get in trouble for that. We appreciate it. Um, And as Viru has stated as well, shout out to the narrative director, Savathun. We appreciate your hard work and uh, continued Imbaru fascination. Um, But no, in in all seriousness, a big, a big shout out to the writing team. Like the writing team has continued. We've, we say this a lot, but the writing team has continued to keep us invested in destiny. I know that for me personally, they are the, the story is pretty 
much the only reason I'm still invested in Destiny. Um, and I, I can't speak, I can't compliment enough the writing team for their, obviously, their part in that. Um, and, you know, just reiterating Green's, Green's shout out, you know, just do random acts of kindness, really. It's, it's just, that's a good thing to try to do um, on a, you know, just randomly. Just be, just, you know, pay for someone's coffee, even. You never, you never know how sometimes these little, the little random acts of kindness actually, you know, pay it forward, if you will. Yep. So, but yeah, so everyone will see you next week. And that's all I got. Bye. 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 With that, we'll begin to wrap the chat up. Thank you again to those over on Twitch for coming to spend your evening with us. If you'd like to join us for the live streaming of the episodes, please be sure to give us a follow over on twitch.tv slash focused fire chat. Links to all our episode archives can also be found at www.focusfirechat.com. Please be sure to email us at focusfirechat at gmail.com with any comments or questions for our team concerning the podcast and let us know how we're doing by giving us some feedback and a rating over on iTunes as well. Also, be sure to check out all the amazing work being featured over on thelorenetwork.com. So until next time, focus your fire and may your light shine bright.